Hello everybody, welcome to Film Gold. We are on video today. You may be hearing this um, in audio form sometime in the future. But here we are, myself and Luke Thompson, who was previously on the show, episode 15, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And we've uh, worked together. It's not work, is it? Let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> many times. <laughs> we've done lots of podcasts. So how are you, mate? I'm fine. All good? Yeah, fine, thanks. Yes. Yeah, yeah, very well. Looking forward to talking about this. Yeah. Um, thanks for sort of letting me come on the show. I feel like I kind of um, invited myself on Film Gold for this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I have to say, because I, I saw the film that we're going to talk about quite recently after my brother had been badgering me, pestering me to see it for ages, and I finally saw it and thought it was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I've just really wanted to talk about. I just want to talk to someone about yeah, it, Anthony. I need to talk to someone. And so, yeah. <laughs> and so um, I thought I would just basically invite myself onto Film Gold uh, <laughs> as a podcaster myself. I know how that is. That you know, people do sometimes just kind of like invite themselves on the show, and it's a bit of a tricky one. You kind of think, yeah. uh, uh, I think I should be the one to decide, but then you know, You've then often I will just say yes. Yeah, I've been on before, so I yeah. I thought it would be, all and we right. traded because we we did a kind of a life and life only profile, which we've done half of. So we yeah. did that last time. Then we did a few recordings in the space of a few days. Get the old magic That's right. going. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, just tell us about your podcast, so Luke's English podcast. For those who don't know, Go on. so uh, like you, I'm an English language teacher as well as other things, um, and I've been doing this podcast um, for ages now. It's this is year 14 for the show. And uh, so it's a podcast for learners of English around the world, adult learners of English. And um, I'll talk about kind of anything really. I want to try to cast my net really wide mm. to talk about lots of different subjects. And you've been on the show a few times. You talked about John Lennon, of course. Um, it's something like four episodes that we mm. did. Um, and then also meditation, we talked about that. And then, as you said, more recently, uh, we we did. We're in the middle of doing a double episode yeah. in which we kind of like talk about all the the life and life only themes that you've that you've discussed, or some of them anyway, because yeah. you've talked about so many things on that that show. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Luke's English podcast is what it's called. It's a very imaginative title, <laughs> which my which my listeners can't spell apparently because they can't spell my name. And they also can't spell podcast. So constantly people, when people write to me, they say, oh, I'm, you know, I've been listening to Lux English Podcat for <laughs> six months. And it's like, okay, yeah. great. I hope it's helped you with your English. Yeah. What, and what's a podcat? I don't know. Yeah. Just, for people, just so people know, your podcast, it's, it's a, I don't say, a, a general podcast where you talk about things in the way that a normal English podcast would. But then what do you do? Weave in a few English language bits. You're not, you, you don't start your podcast by going, oh, we're going to conjugate the verb to be and the stuff. It's not just to make it clear that you don't have to be a non-native speaker to appreciate. Yeah, how yeah, yeah. Weave, yeah that's how do you weave the English teaching into the, into the general discussion? Do you? As you know, as an English teacher, there's several ways you can approach learning or teaching a language. You can do it from the bottom up or you can do it from the top down, you know, mm -hmm. bottom up refers to dealing with the actual mechanics of how the language works, the grammar and, and the phonology and stuff like that. The other approach is to go top down, which is where you, you focus on meaning and understanding messages and communication and using language as a tool. And so people often will assume that you always do it bottom up, that you just study grammar, but you can do it in other ways too. And so the focus of my show was always to um, just try and produce uh, content which is engaging to encourage listeners around the world to listen to more English and to focus on, you know, understanding the messages being spoken and listen to authentic English and to hear the sound of English as it's spoken because a lot of learners of English don't know what to listen to, you know, and the, if you do just like grammar stuff in a podcast, it's incredibly boring mm -hmm. or at least very difficult to do in a, in, a, in an interesting way. Yeah. And so I decided I'd just do sort of topic-based conversational stuff, but then I, you know, I'll I'll I'll, ex I'll stop and explain things. And also, uh, ha having been a teacher for a long time, I sort of know how to talk to learners of English in a way that they can understand it. So you know, that's the general approach. Yeah. So you, you, I mean, you'd have to presume a certain level of English. You know, they're not podcasts for beginners because obviously you'd have to have a certain level to listen to it. Um, podcast in another language and i guess you just naturally modify your voice a little bit 
as yeah, you were doing yeah, yeah. in English or, class anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, you know, uh, most sort of people don't really know exactly what we do in our job, right? Mm. As English teachers, you know, people have got us in, uh, assumptions about what we do, that we always teach grammar, that we teach kids. And that, you know, most of my friends seem to think that as an English teacher, I basically spend about maybe two hours a day sitting in a room with like three Japanese children. <laughs> and I'm sort of going, this is red, this is yellow, yeah. this is blue, here's the alphabet, good, let's have lunch. Mm. You know, that's kind of what they think I do. Mm. But most people in the world learning English have got a certain level. You mm. know, it's rare that you find people who, who are starting at, you know, level zero, as it were. Mm. Unlike most English people, if we're, you know, going to try and learn Italian or whatever, we just start from scratch. Mm. But most people out there in the world know quite a lot of English already. Yeah. And it's we're just trying to help them develop fluency and confidence and total control and to get to a level where they can function sort of at work in a very um, effective way and stuff like that. All right. You brilliant. Know? Okay. Um, we better get on because we've got so much to talk about here. We do. But yeah, you brought this film to my attention. Um, a friend of mine, Scott Phipps, who I've also done a lot of podcasts with, I appear on his film shows and he's been on Glass Onion and Film Gold as well. Mm. He's a big fan of this as well and he alerted it to me. So just the the basic particulars of the film. So 1977, technically a thriller, according to Wikipedia, directed and produced by William Friedkin, who apparently was given some kind of free reign, um, which is something the studio quickly regretted. Although we, we benefited from it. Um, yeah. The only person in the cast I really knew was Roy Scheider, for obvious reasons, you know, French Connection, yeah. Jaws. There's Bruno, I don't even know how to pronounce it, he's Cremer, Francisco Rabal, and uh, Amidou. It's widely considered a remake of the 1953 film The Wages of Fear. Friedkin disagreed with that. Have you read or seen The Wages of Fear? Or do you know if it is a remake? I, I try to watch it. Um, I tried to find it. I couldn't find it anywhere. I saw some clips and stuff. So it's what I understand is that it's not a remake, but it's actually a second um, adaptation of a book. So The Wages of Fear, the, the, the film, is actually an adaptation of a, of a book by the same name. And so Freakin has just adapted the book again. So he didn't remake the film. He just adapted the book again like the previous film yeah did. i was trying to think of some examples of just before we started recording of where it, it's it's based somewhat on a book and has some similarities to an earlier adaptation i can't think of the top of my head but it's obviously been done before that there, there, there are examples of that i know what you mean like you mean uh, a film that's an adaptation of a oh. of a film that was already a book <laughs> yeah it's somewhere between the first version of the film and then the book yeah but uh, mm -hmm. it's been done but Obviously, if you take the idea that creativity is building on previous ideas anyway, and that there's a theory that there's only about seven stories when you get down to it. Um, mm. I looked at The Wages of Fear just a synopsis, and obviously it is pretty similar. But this one is obviously, it's it's got the Friedkin, or it's got the 70s stamp on it. I wouldn't say it's necessarily. If you didn't tell, if you didn't tell me Friedkin had directed this, I wouldn't have said, oh, yeah, it's definitely William Friedkin, but it's got the 70s New Hollywood stamp. Um, which we'll get to in a second. Yeah. Now, the very basic plot, so four outcasts from varied backgrounds meeting in a South American village. It's a it's a kind of subgenre of film where four people happen to meet and then you get the four backstories. Or there's another film, again, I can't bring it to mind, where um, it's, it starts with a car crash involving various people. And then it goes back and you see how the four people got to that street at that particular time. I'm blanking on, oh, I'm wow. blanking on the name, but it's a good subgenre, isn't it? It's an interesting yeah. subgenre. Of like four, like four characters who are sort of united by some event and you, you, you kind of can explore the different s strands of those four stories. Yeah, or it could be and how they, oh, sorry, cool. How they and how they come together, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know what that film is that you're referring to. I know, uh, I'm blanking on it. Sounds good. Anyway, yeah. yeah, so it could be three people, could be five. So it's this idea of just, um, especially if they come from very different places like we have here. You know, we've got Palestinian mm. and then we've got Roy Scheid as Irish American. And it's, I like the subgenre. Right, mm. just before we mm. get um, to the, the film, more into in depth in the film, uh, what your general film taste 
And uh, what is your history or you were telling me kind of lack of history with this film or in the past? Go on. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think my tastes are pretty similar to yours because, you know, having sort of checked out your Film Gold podcast, you know, a lot of the films are the same, you know, so that, that 70s New Hollywood um, era is like definitely one of my favourites. And, you know, all the all the Scorsese films and the, you know, all the Robert De Niro films and um, uh, The Godfather and all those things. I mean, I, I do like a blockbuster as well. So, um, I mean, so do you. I mean, Jaws, for example, is a fantastic film. I, I, I was, maybe still am, a bit of a Star Wars nut, but I think that's not your cup of tea. No. <laughs> and that's interesting star wars because it's sort of like the antithesis to this film released in the same year as we'll explore kind of like maybe is the thing that kind of um mm. uh, assassinated uh sorcerer yes, yes, at yes. the box office um so yeah i kind of like star wars but i don't know since all all the prequels and sequels it's kind of basically diminishing returns from the the first two maybe the first three films yeah um um so yeah i mean that that kind of stuff in terms of this film so i think i said before right my brother um kept telling me to see it mm. he was like oh have you seen sorcerer yet and i was like you know no no i haven't seen it yet so he kept kind of trying to get make me watch it and i finally watched it fairly recently i think it was um probably last year sometime i, I should have been working mm. and i just decided to take the afternoon off yeah and I just found Sorcerer. I just, you know, did one of those things. I don't know if you've ever, you ever do that, where you just type into Google, watch, insert film title, blah, 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 online free. Oh, yeah, yeah. Free movie. And then you have to wait. You have to, yeah, you have to wade through lots of very dodgy links mm. until you eventually find one that actually works. So I did that. And I, I don't know which version I, I saw. I think it was probably the the re-release because it was re-released about 10 years ago on dvd and blu-ray mm. there's a whole story actually behind the production of it and the and the way that freakin managed to get control of it again and, and get it re-released on blu-ray with a uh, a new i don't know how to just des to describe it a new sort of um, new print or? a new, new print yeah. yeah so i think it's probably that one that i saw because it was good quality the one on youtube that you i think you mentioned mm. It's pretty poor quality. I don't know. Yeah. That's like the old VHS or something. Yeah, I think so. But the one I saw is decent. And also, I watched it again recently. I actually bought it on on Apple uh, TV, and, and, and that's a, a very high-quality version. So I'm fairly new to the film mm. and haven't really talked about it very much. I've spoken to my brother about it a bit. We talk about things like the explosions. And <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, they, they are in... I don't know if impressive is the word. I suppose it is, yeah. Pyrotechnics-wise, it's like, wow, those explosions, yeah. Um, going, back to, going back to that thing you said about um, this being a, a remake and the difference between this one and the, and the Wages of Fear, and you said it's definitely got that 70s stamp on it. That's definitely, I think, the main difference. The story is more or less the same, but with this one, you get that grittiness and the dirt and lots of close-ups of people sweating yeah. and covered in oil and grease yeah. and crap and stuff and that i mean I, you know we'll talk about this again later on but you know what is it that i like about this film i don't know really i can't really intellectualize it that much mm. but i sort of enjoy it on a visceral level the 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 griminess of it it's like you know i find that fascinating like this town that they end up in yeah. it's just so dilapidated and awful yeah yeah, oh, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I um, I think Scott told me about it, and and you, I think you mentioned it a few months ago because I watched it about six mm. months ago, I think, for the first time. Uh, I think it came up on a uh, uh, documentary about Friedkin as well, because yeah, we have we have this wonderful channel in England called Sky Arts. I'm sure you're aware of that. They do a yeah, a friend of mine works for it actually. He's oh. a scheduler for it. Oh, excellent. Yeah, and they do a discovering yeah. series of directors, and they're about an hour long. And you get the same mm. same experts, talking heads, but it's good stuff. And that appeared on that because um, we'll talk about Friedkin in a sec. But um, you mentioned seventies New Hollywood, so yeah, my friend Scott and I we call it the Easy Riders Raging Bulls period because there's a book that you've got and I've got. By, there you go. <laughs> there <laughs> it, it is on video. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, <laughs> um, by Peter Biskin. It's it's a quite a gossipy look at this 
we've we've pegged it scott and i have pegged it to just before easy rider maybe bonnie and clyde are the graduate 67 to about heaven's gate which i think is the same year as raging bull so 67 to 80 something like that and it was a period where um you had the first directors coming out of film schools so there's a kind of a group of mates really so you've got scorsese spielberg coppola coppola is a few years older de palma George Lucas, uh, John Milius, who I think ended up being a screenwriter primarily, Apocalypse Now, for example, and he even contributed mm. to Jaws as well. Um, and you also had, and they were very into Russian expressionists and German expressionists. So that's where you get this documentary thing, which we'll definitely get to. Um, and also the producers were doing a lot of cocaine and they loosened, <laughs> they loosened their grip a little bit. Um, yeah, it's wild and that, you that all those films. And then you had, um, you basically, I always, I've always said, and I've said that to you, the swinging 60s is about 65 to about 75, realistically. You know, I don't think Britain or America was swinging in about 1961. So the, the new Hollywood overlaps with it a little bit, maybe lagging a few years behind. But what do mm -hmm. you think of the hallmarks mm -hmm. of this new Hollywood? Is it basically that? It's a sort of cynicism, right? Mm. And, and, um, um a, a cynicism maybe in the sense that um the the, the vietnam war is going on and it's kind of questioning american values mm. and a lot of anti-heroes yeah. uh existentialism um but in, in the I mechanics of the films you would just say documentary style definitely and longer shots and longer right. held shots and things like that French New Wave cinema as well influenced it a lot too, yes, which is, yes. yeah, very naturalistic, um, uh, naturalistic stuff. Like a lot of the, the domestic scenes in, in, in um, Spielberg films, you know, like Close Encounters, mm. um, messy kind of handheld close-up shots of domestic life. Yeah. Um, yes, yes. I mean, and... and Compare, I mean, going back to uh, The Wages of Fear versus this film, The Wages of Fear is a much cleaner sort of experience, it seems. Yeah. Whereas, whereas as I said before, in this one, you've got all the, the, that kind of, yeah, that realism, the gritty realism. Yeah, yeah. that's it. And a, and a certain non-commercial, well, sometimes non-commercial, Jaws was obviously massively commercial, but there's a mix. Yeah, yeah that's, in, oh. that's interesting, mm. that sort of new Hollywood was killed by itself in a way mm. because um spielberg and george lucas with with jaws and then star wars completely kind of changed uh cinema and sent everything off in a completely different direction yeah it's weird. into the blockbuster kind of thing yeah, it's weird it got killed by two things at the same time one was the blockbuster but obviously jaws has got a primal sense about it so it's, it's got a one foot in that 70s thing then that became, but then you had the Heaven's Gate and to some extent Sorcerer. You had um, failures that killed it. So it was sort of killed by success and failure. It's, it's quite fascinating, but really. The, I feel like the failure of Sorcerer is a result of the success of Star Wars, you know, oh, yeah. which is Failure, kind of yeah. from that same school of, of uh, mm. filmmaking. Um, what I'm saying is mm. the success of certain films uh, are sort of brought Hollywood back to the idea that success was more important than art. Although, of course, you can have both, of course. The Beatles, for example. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. But then, there you go. You got one. But then uh, the box office failure means, oh, we're not going to give you the money to make these experimental films. So that, that was my point. That it was killed by two opposites. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then another feature of the new Hollywood um, movement, maybe, is the sort of auteurism. Definitely. The idea of, like, total artistic control. Yeah which reached its zenith with these two films that you talked about, this one and, and Heaven's Gate, which I haven't seen. No, I haven't either. No, I've heard good things about it, though. Um, I saw the trailer. It looked pretty good. Mm, yeah, Michael It's like a great yeah. Western, yeah, with, like, Christopher Walken yeah. and other Hollywood stars. Oh, that looks amazing. Maybe they just did a really good old job on the trailer. Or maybe, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, like Sorcerer, you know, it's got this bad reputation, but if you actually watch it, it could be incredible, you know? Yeah. Just a couple of other things about the new Hollywood. The two examples mm. I always give of this documentary feel are the fact that French Connection has got scenes that 
that looked like a documentary about stakeout cops, just really bored and he's drinking cheap coffee and eating, you know, buns or something, waiting, <laughs> waiting for something to happen. And then uh, we've just done Deliverance. It was a it was a swap cast basically on Scott's uh, show. So it may or may not be yeah. out by the time people are seeing this or hearing this. And Deliverance has got scenes that look a bit like a boating documentary. You know, it's only a few minutes, but you just, just four guys. It's like a home video, four blokes from the city having a canoeing holiday. And obviously <laughs> it's made even worse by the fact of what happens to them in that film, um, which we won't spoil now, but you get the idea, you know. Yeah, there is a lot of realism, that's for sure. Mm. Definitely a lot of realism in, in, that, in those films. Yeah. Um, you see that in Taxi Driver as well. Yes. Which, which, you know, Scorsese made documentaries as well, didn't yes, he? he did, yeah. And so, and and also, um, the French Connection, that car chase, yes. which is like the outstanding sequence in the film. Yeah. They just did that, right? They just, they just like drove a car really fast down the street yeah. during the day without blocking off the roads. Like a lot of the yeah. other cars are just normal civilians just driving around. It's unbelievable, yeah. I mean, there's a woman yeah. with is it a woman with a pram or something, and he nearly hits her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah. And I mean, the stunt. I mean, I have so much respect for stunt men, stunt people. You know, I mean, wow, <laughs> that is yeah. just amazing. But yeah, the lack, the lack of um, uh, control, lack of uh, well, lack of professionalism, if you want to call it that. Of like not not yeah. checking everything out and leaving things to chance. It's very dangerous, obviously. <laughs> but of course, we yeah. we reap the benefits years later, don't we? You know, we get to see. Yeah, the that. idea of, of 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 that happening in a sort of mainstream film now yeah. that they would just do do it that way. I mean, obviously these days everything is like so tightly controlled. Yeah. But yeah, there was like a kind of it's just crazy. Yeah, the lives they were leading. Mm. And the the work they were doing, yeah, thank God. I mean, crazy, but I'm glad they did yeah, it. Yeah, we benefit yeah. from it. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, with, with Sorcerer, the other thing about it, I watched it a few months ago, and mm -hmm. I always feel some, oh, I don't know if pressure is the right word. It seems like a silly word, but when mm. the first time I see a film, especially if it's been recommended, I feel some somewhat pressure to get it or to fully appreciate it. And then when yeah. you suggested doing this um, last week, I just knew straight away I'm going to absolutely love this film the second time because I I can just relax a bit, even though we're doing doing it for a podcast, because there isn't an intricate plot, because it's fairly obvious what is going on. Again, I, I feel liberated when I see films like that. You know, that, that then, then you can tap into the themes and you can feel what the themes are without having to think, oh, who's that guy? Oh, yeah. How do these two things yeah. come together? It's liberating, yeah. you know? Yeah, definitely, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, it's, it's a funny one, uh, recommending films to people. It's like recommending music to people, mm. isn't it? Because you can go, oh, you've got to listen to this album. It's amazing. Mm. It's brilliant. It's life-changing. Yeah. It's like, you know... <laughs> Uh, and and then you give it to them, and and there's no way that it's going to live up to the expectations yeah. that you built up for it. Same thing with films. So, I mean, with my brother, I mean, the, the, we're so close that I just trust his opinion. Mm. And so, if he says it's good, then I just know that it'll be good. But also, it's a question of like finding the right moment to watch something. And I just think I was in the right place. Yeah. You know, it was just the right moment to watch it on that particular day. I was bored and a bit fed up. Yeah. And it was exactly what I needed, you know, this visceral sort of uh, existential experience. Yeah. It really, really did it for me. Sometimes. I'm... So you enjoyed it. You enjoyed it more second time round. Did yeah, you? I, just, I just knew I would because I remember I'd liked it, but I was a little bit, I don't know, maybe baffled perhaps. Uh, I don't know why. I mean, I have a fairly mm. broad minded taste and I like some really avant garde stuff where nothing happens at all. You know, I, I, I've got a space <laughs> for that as well. Same with music as yeah. well, you know. I can, we'll talk about um, crowd rock in a minute. Um, yeah, stuff like craft work and that where it, it, it tests the tests the listener. Or that's the other thing about these films. You're, you're testing the patience of uh, viewers. Mm. So as I'm sure you'd agree with this, as our culture, as our attention spans are getting shortened and shortened, and you have to really fight it now to, to listen to a whole album. You know, I, I, yeah. I make a point of making myself do it, right? Listen to the album from start to finish watch the film from start to finish instead of this um, temptation to skip around. Mm. 
So I think I think people really, when they go back and and they do want to test themselves and watch something that's not that easy to watch, um, you admire it more. Like I love, you know, like a five minute shot or whatever. Now I get off on it, you know. I love it, you know. I like the documentary because I love documentaries, so you know, can't really go wrong. Mm, mm. Um, what I'd like to do is just talk about the two people involved with this film that I was familiar with because I didn't really know any of the other people apart from one guy who had a bit part. Uh, so William Friedkin. So just very briefly, the films I've seen of his. Uh, there's one called The Birthday Party, which is based on a Pinter play. I'm a big Robert Shaw fan. You probably know that. Robert yeah. Shaw's in that film. It's, that's pretty good. Obviously, the big two are The French Connection and The Exorcist. And then we've got Saucer, obviously. Um, on this Friedkin documentary, there was a film called Cruising, which I think is 1980 with Al Pacino. Uh-huh. Um, but, but then uh, I look through his filmography and I, I don't really know anything after that. So how many of those have, have you seen all of those films or most of them? I haven't seen any of those films. The only other Friedkin films that I'm familiar with are um french connection and the exorcist right. both of which i absolutely love they're like two of my favorite films absolutely. so i don't really know why i haven't i didn't again like i wonder how these films come to come to us i think a, a lot of these films were presented to us on on tv right mm. with films like was it movie was it movie, movie drone yeah Lovely. with uh who's that guy that uh mark cousins mark who, cousin Fine. He speaks in a very strange kind of way about films. That's very good, yeah. You know, I think it was Clint Eastwood who said it was the worst film he'd ever seen. You know, there was Mark Cousins and also Mark Hermode, right, who presented yeah. these. And then originally it was Alex Cox, of course, who had yeah, brilliant, brilliant right. deadpan delivery. Yeah. Yeah. That was a yeah. brilliant Mark Cousins. I like the way he pronounced sound. <laughs> Signed. 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 Yeah. It's not just a Northern Irish accent. Some of your some of your uh, viewers or listeners might not know who we're talking about now. He's a filmmaker himself these days, but uh, it's not just a Northern Irish accent. There's something else to it too. Because mm. if it was just a Northern Irish accent, it'd be like this film made by uh, William Friedkin in 1977 was tipped to be, you know, it was supposed to be a great film. Film, yeah. but he's like this film, which was made in 1977. Yeah. You know, it's, he's got such a weird delivery, but great shows that uh, I think they're on BBC Two. I think it was because um, they were just intros. They weren't actually shows themselves, but you get a little intro. But just the series yeah. itself. And I always say to people, if you look online, you can see the lists of all the films. So I would say to people, if you want to broaden your taste, work through a few of those, you know. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of those films are, you know, these 70s films I've discovered from, you know, things like Movie Drome mm. and stuff. And uh but yeah, for some reason, those other freaking films were not, they didn't find their way to me. And I think mm. after this one, you said Cruising was, was 1980, yeah, so that's after I think this? So, yeah, three years after this. I think, mm. I think probably freaking found it difficult to make films in Hollywood after, sure. after Sorcerer. Sure. I think he went to Europe. These days, he directs operas and, and stuff. Mm. There's a good interview with him on Mark Maron's podcast. Oh, okay. Um, WTF with Mark Maron. Um, from a few years ago that's great it's like two and a half hour conversation wow. he's a good talker he, isn't he yeah he's a great talker great yeah. sort of raconteur yeah definitely yeah um okay uh, then we get to oh yeah so so really freaking i mean that just just those two films alone plus plus sorcerer uh, i mean that's a pretty good con contribution to uh, <laughs> culture um he was a documentarian and then he had a little claim to fame. He directed one of the last episodes of the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. And I think Hitchcock was actually on set. Um, so that would have been, that would have been interesting. <laughs> but yeah. you get, I, I don't think The Exorcist has got those documentary elements, or has it? I, I could believe that Sorcerer was made by the guy who made French Connection. But I don't see too much link with The Exorcist. I don't know. I think The Exorcist is a little bit, uh, I don't know. It's commercial, the word. I don't know. It, it doesn't seem so documentary as the others. No, not no, no, no. I don't really see the documentary stuff in Exorcist either. No. There are some th similar things between the Exorcist and Sorcerer, though. Oh, go on, tell us a couple of those. I mean, just like the way that the Exorcist opens, it opens with. Is it the shot of that st sort of demonic statue? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, does does it open in name? Iraq or? 
Or do they cut yeah. between? Yeah, yeah. They start in Iraq. They start with that weird sequence where, what's his name? The Swedish actor. Can't Max von Sydow. Now. Max von Sydow is like searching. He finds this weird statue and it's like really creepy and scary. And, and we don't know why, but it's so weird. Yeah. I feel like this one opens in a similar way. It opens with the that weird face, mm. if you remember. Yeah. And the title, Sorcerer, and the weird, creepy uh, electronic soundtrack. And it opens in a, in a foreign location, mm. foreign to, to us, or certainly foreign to the filmmakers. Oh, that's true. Yeah, so yeah you're right. feels kind of similar, in, you know, at the beginning. Yeah. Um, but that's more or less it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, th but th this film, um, as we may discuss, it, there's nothing supernatural in it, unlike The Exorcist. Mm. And this film came after The Exorcist, and it's called Sorcerer. Yeah. So people probably assumed it would be something like The Exorcist. But there's nothing supernatural specifically in it. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's more about nature and, 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 and real, society. Real life in a way, isn't it? It's yeah. the grittiness of real life. Um, what about... But having... Mm. I was going to say, but having having said that, there is something, there's something about something supernatural in the atmosphere of the film. Mm. Yeah. In, and the sort of dreamlike stuff, especially near the end when the characters start, their, their, their mental state starts to break down. Yes. And it does get a bit kind of creepy and supernatural at that point. Yeah. And what about the title, Sorcerer? I mean, you and I both watched the same video independently. We were just talking about it. I'll put it in the show notes. It's a really good, um, you know, one of those YouTube analysis, film analysis videos. Um, the sorcerer is supposed to be the, the, the wizard of fate, you know, the implacable thing. That uh, Have you ever heard anything else about the title or why he chose that? Because I, I haven't. No, not really. Mm. Uh, it was, it, to be honest, it, he made a mistake with the title, right? I mean, it, mm. it, he shouldn't have called it sorcerer you should have called it something else because it's very confusing and misleading it's yeah. you know you think it's going to be a the you know another exorcist or something about wizards and magic and stuff yeah. but that's got nothing to do with it but the sorcerer is just the name of one of the trucks and even that doesn't really make sense because i don't really know why one of the trucks is called sorcerer and why he chose that to be the title of the film so yeah no it's a bit odd choice that one just being contrarian perhaps maybe Maybe this was just like uh, um, a great exercise in control freakery. Yeah. And, you know, he had all the control he wanted. The studio gave him total control. And so just naming it Sorcerer was kind of like, almost like a, like the giving the finger to the audience in a, in a weird yeah. way. It's a kind of a cruel film. It's cruel to the, to the characters and it's cruel to the audience as well. Yeah. yeah. Which I like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> yeah, I suppose if you're, I don't know much about Freakin's background, but if you if you have the anti-establishment way about you, which I'm sure a lot of those guys from and the musicians of the '60s, there was definitely that flavour. If they give you mm -hmm. loads of money, there's almost some part of you that feels like it might be fun to sabotage it, you know, to waste all their money in a sense. Not not yeah, waste just... it artistically, but waste it in their eyes. You know, blow loads of money on a title that's going to get people in thinking they're going to get one thing and then they're going to come out disappointed because it was nothing you know it was like that kind of thing there must be something kind of fun about completely um uh, subverting the expectations of the audience and kind of like ha 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 you think you're going to see the exorcist which was a fairly commercial kind of film but no i'm gonna i'm gonna pull the rug from right underneath you i'm gonna challenge you all the way and then i'm gonna take you on this horrific journey from which you might never recover yeah. you know and i won't give you a happy ending yeah instead i'm going to give you one of those really difficult endings where if you went out on a date to see this film the two of you are going to have a really awkward evening afterwards <laughs> mm. have you ever seen um <laughs> just oh god i just had a memory of something have you ever seen the film irreversible uh, no, I haven't, but Have I know about, about it. it. Yeah. Okay, yes. I, I'm not going to go into it for the audience, but Irreversible is a, a film by Gaspar Noé. He's an amazing filmmaker. And he makes, let, let's call it, challenging films. I was flat sharing in West London in the early 2000s. I was very friendly with an Australian guy called Piers, just in case he's, he's watching this. G'day, Yeah, Piers. we're kind of in, in, we're in social media contact, but not really real contact. Mm -hmm. And he was a right joker. You know, we had great times. We had a lot of fun in those days. You know, guys in our 20s, you can fill in the rest in London. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I was going on a date with somebody. 
And um, he said, oh, and I, I talked about it. And he said, oh, Anthony, come here, come here. It's this really amazing film that's come out. It'd just be perfect for a date. Yeah, it's just, it's just, <laughs> yeah you know what's coming. It's, it's this French film. But he said, uh, I think, I don't know if this was pre-internet. No, there was internet, but it wasn't what it is now. You know, there wasn't YouTube, I don't think, at that time. It was early 2000s. He said, look, listen, don't find out anything about it, okay? <laughs> he said, oh, just take this girl to the film. She, she'll absolutely love it. You know, you're <laughs> So I should just say to your viewers, our viewers, in mm. fact, that um, your internet just went down and so we've started again and that's why I'm now in a t-shirt. So <laughs> you might have thought, what happened? Yeah. So it's that's not it. that It's not a special ability you've got to take your job. No, it's not, it's not a special ability to just magically like, over your head change, and change, no. without anyone noticing. It's a Beatles t-shirt as well. Can you see that? Ah, uh, this is album. my my white album T-shirt. Yeah, yeah. Can't see the serial number. That's the only thing. No, unfortunately yeah. not. No, but it's got. I don't know why, but there is a track listing on the back here somewhere. Oh, is it? <laughs> Oh, very good. Love it. It's a subtle, subtle Beatles T-shirt that no one ever notices. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> no. All right. Right, you were in the middle of a story about the film Irreversible. You were saying that your uh, flatmate, your Australian flatmate, My cheeky had Australian flatmate. Yeah. yeah had um I, I had a date cheeky australian flatmate uh said take her to see this film irreversible it's really romantic <laughs> the most important thing don't find out anything about it you know because I, I want it to surprise you don't know if you said that but <laughs> you get the point mm -hmm. my friend pierce and um took this girl she did walk out after the subway scene who can blame her yeah of but, course but i patched it up and explained what my flatmate was like and then she okay. met my flatmate and realized and then it was all plain sailing Okay, because I, I thought it was going to be like a... Yeah. a oh, really? <laughs> Until she suddenly realised all the other flaws in your character. Yeah, she realised what I was like then. But it took a few <laughs> months, so it's fine. I thought it was going to be one of the, like a Travis Bickle story, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, Where he, no. takes, he takes Betsy to the cinema. He's like, what's the, what's the matter? Why? Yeah, yeah what's no, the you, problem? Yeah. You weren't that clueless, thankfully. No, no, no. no. Anyway, um, where were we with that? Why was I talking uh, we, about we, we were talking about basically it's not a date movie, um, Sorcerer. Mm. I think that's kind of what we were saying. Mm. Yeah, we were talking about yeah. how um, maybe it was Friedkin's strange idea to, to sabotage or, or to waste the studio's money or put one over on the audience, perhaps. Yeah, Something and this like could that. be what happens when you when you let one person, one auteur, have total mm. control over a project that they end up doing slightly crazy things, like giving it a really weird title, mm. and yeah, screwing over the studio and maybe screwing over the audience. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. it. Um, let's talk about Roy Scheider. So again, I'll just talk about a few films I've seen him in from that period. I mean. He was hot at that time. So Clue, uh, the French connection, obviously, with Friedkin. They got on very well on the French connection. Didn't get on so well on this, which we'll explore. Um, Jaws, obviously, Marathon Man. Even Jaws 2, I didn't think was that bad. I saw it again last year. Not terrible. And all that jazz, which I've seen once, which is very, very different Roy Scheider. Mm. And then he was in the uh, sequel to 2001 called 2010. So yeah. again, have you seen those? I guess you've seen those seventies ones, haven't you? You know, you know what? I'm I'm sounding very um, cine illiterate here when you keep saying, "Have you you've seen that?" Right? And I'm like, uh, "No." <laughs> uh, so I, I haven't seen that many Roy Scheider films. Obviously, I've seen Jaws and The French Connection. I've seen Jaws Two, which I really like, hmm. especially the bit where the shark's eye burns out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I Marathon like Man. Marathon Man. Yes. Yeah. I haven't even I haven't seen Marathon Man. Wow. I mean, there are little gaps. I think I'm quite kind of well versed in cinema, actually, mm. uh, but there are fairly significant gaps. Mm. Um, it's I, you know, it's like my cinema uh, viewing history is like a like a big sweater that's been moth eaten. No, that's mm. a terrible analogy. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> anyway, so no, I haven't seen Marathon Man either. But yeah, he's an interesting actor, Roy Scheider, because he's. He's not exactly a leading man, is he? Mm. But he, he's quite unconventional looking. Mm. Interesting actor. What, what do you think about him? Well, I've written down here, weather-beaten boxer's face. And in fact, he was an amateur boxer. He had an interesting upbringing. He was into boxing and then he switched to drama. So he's got obviously the physicality, but then he's got the, the drama. He's got the artistic side. 
Yeah. I think I know him so well from Jaws. So I see that vulnerability because famously, of course, he plays the chief of police who's afraid of the ocean yeah. and has to overcome it. And um, we actually decided when we did Deliverance recently, I don't know how, if you remember that film well, but John Voight's journey is quite mm. similar to Brody. Yeah. And that if you think of the Burt Reynolds character as the Quint character, you know, the, the yeah. rugged guy, um, when he, when he dies or is incapacitated, uh, Scheider takes over. So he's definitely not leading man. He's not, you know, he's not Warren Beatty, let's face it, but he's got an yeah. interesting, he's got an interesting look about him. And in this film, I was thinking about it. I actually think he's a, almost a bit miscast. I don't think he's a natural for this at all. It's just my opinion. Mm. But he makes it work because he's just, particularly when they're in poor veneer, because he's got that weather-beaten, world-weary look about him. Yeah, he's got those interesting eyes uh, yes. that he can do a kind of an empty stare quite well. Yes. And there's quite a lot of that in, in this town where they're just, there's a couple of moments where, like, he locks eyes with another person, another one of these sort of uh, outcasts who's ended up there. They kind of lock eyes in this really sort of intense way. Mm. And of course, there's the final shot of his face as the camera slowly pans towards him and he's just got this far away yeah. uh, look in his eyes. So, yeah. Should we talk about um, the fact that he wasn't the original, for, he wasn't the first choice for the for the role? Yeah, what do we know then? What? Who did uh, Freakin envision, envision for this role? So he wanted, um, what's his name? Steve McQueen. <sighs> Steve McQueen. Mm. Which would have made the film completely different because Steve McQueen obviously is like, you know, a, star. Uh, a huge star mm. with incredible levels of charisma. Mm. Um, and it would have been a different story, I think, with him in it. I would have, it would have been amazing. Yeah. with Steve McQueen in it. There's no doubt. I don't know if they would have managed, managed to do it because mm. Steve McQueen was also kind of a problematic person, especially sort of in the late 70s. Yeah. So I, I can, it would have been difficult. Him and Freakin definitely would have clashed in a, in a massive way, I can, I can imagine. So I, I, ex I expect that Scheider was a bit more agreeable, although he didn't really, you know, as you said, like him and Freakin really sort of like, I think Freakin clashed with everyone on this film and not just because of you know, his directing, but just the conditions they were living in and stuff. But yeah, Steve McQueen was the first choice, but he, um, he, he, he read the script. He said it was the best script he'd ever read. Hmm. And he was really up for it. Um, but then he just got married to Ali McGraw hmm. and he didn't want to leave the country. He wanted to, you know, he didn't want to go off to some far flung location. Hmm. Um, and he, in fact, he also wanted uh, Freakin to, write a part into the script for Ali McGraw too. Yeah. I don't know how they could have worked that into it. There aren't really many women in this film, except for the the sort of the the, the woman who scrubs the floor. And the right. wife the wife of the of the Frenchman at the beginning. When the, right. She's reading the poetry, yeah. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But um so I don't know how, how they would have got her involved uh, in it too. But um mm. yeah, so Steve McQueen kind of said, Yeah, I love the script, so I'd I'd love to be part of it, but I want to do it in, in the States. And Freakin said, No, that's not possible, so they couldn't uh, use him. Yeah. yeah, that happened with uh, Richard Dreyfus in Jaws. Originally he turned it down, he said, Oh, it's gonna be a bitch to shoot it. He said, but when it comes out in the cinema, I'll definitely watch it. You know, he, he said that to <laughs> right. him and Spielberg were somewhat friends. Yeah, probably, I don't know how well they knew each other, but yeah, that was a little joke they had between them. Oh, I'll right, definitely yeah. buy a ticket and watch it. <laughs> but I'm not making it with you because it's going to be horrible. And he was right, you know, he was right. Sh Shider said that Jaws, compared to this film, Jaws was a, a walk in the park. Yeah, like a cheap party. Or something. Gives you an idea of what it must have been like to make Sorcerer. Yes, definitely. All right. There's just one other guy I wanted to mention was Joe Spinell. And if you haven't heard of him, um, he's one of these people who found himself in a lot of those seminal um, 70s films. Not quite like John Cazale, because John Cazale was a major part. John Cazale famously, I think, was only in five films in his whole life. And they were Two Godfathers, Deer Hunter, Dog Day Afternoon, and uh, what was the other? Uh, and The Conversation, mm -hmm. which I get is 
possibly like Sorcerer. Loads of people would have never yeah. even heard of that film. That's one I've never seen. And yeah. I, I would really want to see it because it's got Gene Hackman in it. And I just love Gene Hackman. Uh, yeah, but yeah, brilliant. there's another one I haven't seen. Francis Ford Coppola, isn't it? Yeah. But Joe Spinell found his way into two Rocky films. You've probably known from Rocky. He's the loan shark that Rocky's working for. Gazza. I tell you what, I know him from Taxi Driver because that's yeah. perhaps my favourite film of all time. And he's the guy interviewing yes, uh, Travis yes. Bickle at the, at the beginning. And at he's the like, beginning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he got himself into two Rockies, two Godfathers. He was in the first two Godfathers, um, and then Taxi Driver, and then obviously, well, it's it's a, it's a bit blink and you'll miss him in this. But I just wanted to mention him because he's one of those people that's right in the midst of that seventies thing, but was never actually a leading man himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. Um, right, let's talk about the music. Um, it's funny because before I I didn't know who the music was by. It came on. And I, I thought it sounded really cheesy. And then I thought maybe this is some sort of ironic point in that the film's really, really realistic and brutal and the music's a bit cheesy. But then I thought you could also say the music's quite ethereal, so you could choose your word almost. But this is Tangerine Dream who are in the, the Krautrock genre. So what do we know about Krautrock? Do you have an um, encyclopedic knowledge of it? I don't really it. have that much encyclopedic knowledge of it, except that it's it, you know it's German, um, a German musical movement, and lots of synthesizers, you know, and they they kind of um, pioneered the use of synthesizers really, and mm. arguably groups like um, Kraftwerk sort of invented techno. Yeah, you know, so the, it can't be underestimated the the importance of of the Germans and, and the influence they had on music. You know, it's, I love the soundtrack. I think it's, I think it's, I just love those sorts of uh, textured synthesizer sounds and stuff. Mm. And it's mm. an interesting, it's an interesting sort of combination or juxtaposition of the sort of gritty, muddy jungle mm. scenes. And this kind of, as you say, ethereal uh, 80s synthesizer, well, I say 80s, 70s, but mm. uh, synthesizer music. And, that for me sort of definitely contributes a lot to the atmosphere of the film and helps to create that sort of supernatural feeling and that kind of um, uh, edgy kind of uh, sensation. Like, you know, some of the scenes, like when the, when the, the explosion at the oil plant is, is revealed and mm. there are sh helicopter shots and... And also the the scenes where they're doing up the trucks before they go off on their expedition, uh, the 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 soundtrack really helps to bring a whole layer of atmosphere to it and a spookiness to it. Mm. Yeah, I just felt like there was a bit of irony built into it into it mm -hmm. as well at times. Yeah, um, the thing about I did listen to a radio documentary about um, crap rock a while ago. It's something to do with industrial sounds, Maybe not this soundtrack, but in general they have. Um, Kraftwerk used to have industrial sounds like machinery sounds. It was something to do with the ultimate computerized music. That was the idea. Mm. But the only real bands I know, Kraftwerk, Tangerine Dream. I mean, I, I've only ever heard the name. And yeah. Can. And a friend of mine got me into Can about ten years ago, and he said it's Radiohead before Radiohead even existed. And I, yeah, I can hear that. It's very mood music. If you're in the mood for it. Kraftwerk famous did a song called uh, Autobahn, which is the German motorway, isn't it? Like, have some yeah. fun on the Autobahn. It's that kind of thing. And it's, <laughs> if you can tap into the vibe of it, it's really good. Like, my cousin Jonathan, he might, again, might be watching. He, he loves it. He loves crap rock. Yeah, like, I love that stuff. I, I really mm. like electronic music and uh, I like chunky, squelchy synthesizer sounds. And mm. yeah, I love Kraftwerk. I think they're amazing. Yeah. And I like electro and, and stuff. You know, it's one of the things I love about the film. I love those sounds. Yeah. It's just wonderful. No, it works brilliantly. Yep. Mm. Um, just a little bit more on casting. So as, as you said earlier, you, Steve McQueen was into the film, wanted Ali McGraw. For anyone who's never heard of Ali McGraw, I guess Love Story would be the most famous film she made. Yeah, uh, the getaway, the getaway as well with, with Steve McQueen, which is a great film. It feels uh -huh. like a Tarantino movie or something. That's a gap in mine because that's 73, I think. That's right in the, the belly of the beast of this mm. new Hollywood, yeah. Um, okay, so some other names. Clint Eastwood, Jack Nicholson, uh, Robert How Mitchell. are they? How are they involved? 
No, they, they were um, uh, Freakin's choices, other choices. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Nicholson was on an incredible run at that time. You know, it's just after Cuckoo's Nest, I suppose, but he'd done Easy Rider as well. Yeah. Uh, neither of them wanted to travel. <laughs> I don't know if that's yeah. wanted to travel at all or travel to this horrible place that they were, he was planning to take them to. Robert Mitchum, uh, despite appreciating the script, he sternly declined asking Friedkin, why would I go, want to go to Ecuador? Did they film in Ecuador? I thought it was Colombia, anyway. For two or three they, months to fall out of a truck. I can do that outside my house. <laughs> <That's a> good, <laughs> line. <laughs> good line. Good line. I mean, Lee, Lee Marvin was offered Quint in Jaws and said, no, I'd rather go fishing myself, you know, rather yeah. than mess around on the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it Isn't it there? funny how, how just like... F- I mean, we were talking about fate or just mm. like the, I don't know what it is, like the sense of just magic or something mm. that uh, plays its part in the production of a film. Oh, absolutely. Where if they'd got someone else, if they'd got, if, they, if it'd been anyone else, it would have been a completely different project. Or if Lee Marvin had accepted the role for Jaws, it wouldn't have, I mean, it, potentially it would have, it would have bombed. It might not have. Yeah, maybe. I mean, like Quint is just so amazing. Robert Shaw is just so amazing in that film mm. um, that that maybe just that one piece. If that one piece hadn't been there, then the mm. f- Jaws wouldn't have been the phenomenon that it was. Spielberg's career might not have gone in the direction it went. Yeah, the whole what universe if? might be pointed in a completely different direction. Yeah, we might not be having this conversation. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um... I've, as I've got older, I have realised that um, even though I, I, kind of, I get on Hollywood's case about you know always taking safe choices nowadays and never taking any real risks or them, I'm sure they do. But if you read or if you listen to director commentaries or you read books about making films, you realise you realise you know they're playing with you know it was a few million dollars in these in those days, but that's whatever it is now, that's a, a, sh- a shed load of money, and yeah. you can see why they wouldn't want to risk, and they they obviously. They must have known what Friedkin was like as a guy. You know, they always use that phrase, the ego has landed, you know. Yeah. Plus, uh, I don't want to, you know, make accusations, but I'm sure there was cocaine. I mean, there was cocaine flying around Hollywood at that point and the music industry. So I don't know where the substances were involved. I've never heard of anything. But I don't I don't get that impression from Friedkin. I don't know if he was involved in substances. Mm. I know Scorsese was for sure. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, uh, but I don't. I never got that from freaking. But who knows? Might be wrong. Mm-hmm. But there were drug busts on. The, or there were there were potential drug busts on the set of the film. That uh, right, right. At, at some point, someone told freaking, uh, you know, the crew have got some gear, mm. and they're going to get busted. So you need to step in and sort this out. So a lot of the crew members had to go home to avoid getting busted and right. you know it's one of the many dramas that happened during the making of the film there were weren't there yeah what we're going to do um um in a minute um i printed off the sort of greatest hits of the imdb trivia page because it was about half a mile long it was <laughs> very very about 100 items it's absolutely incredible mm. um yeah in fact let's do that now um so we both have this printout do you want to cherry pick let's take it in turns go on Cherry pick a bit of trivia and we'll talk about it. There's a lot, isn't there? <laughs> okay, I'm having a I'm having a look at the notes here that you mm. sent to me. Um, uh, well, I mean, the first thing in the list here is the fact that the film opened in June, in summer 1977, mm. at the 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 Man's Chinese Theatre, Hollywood, that famous cinema, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it completely tanked. It bombed completely. Well, not, and, no, not originally. Originally, no, it was doing well. It was doing it, well. It was and doing well at the start. See, I understood, what I understood is that Star Wars came out, mm. and then it had its run, and then it, it stopped, and it was replaced by Sorcerer, right? Uh, and then no one was seeing Sorcerer, and everyone wanted to see Star Wars, so they just basically took Sorcerer out and put Star Wars back in the cinemas again. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So it really got you know you got seriously uh destroyed by Derailed, the popularity yeah. of star wars yeah. um that's the central point isn't it really that it came out at the same time I'm not sure the exact timing yeah. probably probably there's a couple of different stories but yeah they came out around the same time and yeah star wars yeah, yeah and you know star wars is the antithesis to this film i think 
as I said before. And, mm. you know, that Star Wars is like the escapism. It's very shiny, very clean. Mm. Um, and uh, it's, you know, got a happy ending. It's very much kind of a, a fantasy and, and so on. Mm. Whereas Sorcerer is like, you know, a journey into the, the, the sort of dark heart of, of human nature. And, mm. and it's like so different to Star Wars in so many ways. Uh, it, it's i was just going to add that funnily enough in the some of the more recent star wars stuff in the in the mandalorian tv series there is a sequence an action sequence uh where they have to transport these very volatile explosives across the jungle mm -hmm. in a big truck um and it's definitely a, a an homage a homage an homage uh to um to sorcerer which is interesting since star wars is the film that kind of you know uh, did a job on Sorcerer, but yeah, yeah. it's interesting that. Um, it could be the reason, maybe the, yeah, so a little just A little nod, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, the um, the budget went up from, I think I think it recouped 9 million out of 21 million. I think it originally it was 15 million budget, and it went up to 21, and uh, there were delays, there was a jungle shooting and a hurricane that wiped out the set and that immediately made me think of Apocalypse Now, which is a film that I have intimate knowledge of in terms of the making. And uh, I, I think the IMDb trivia is ju it's just members of the public. I don't know if it's all vetted. So we don't know if all these details are accurate, but there is an idea that Friedkin had some, felt in his head, some rivalry with Coppola. And Coppola had actually started uh, Apocalypse Now in 76, amazingly, even though it came out in 79. So there was uh, some idea that Coppola went to the Philippines to, to do Apocalypse Now, so Freakin went to Latin America to shoot Sorcerer. Um, it sounds a bit fanciful to say to outdo him, you know, if you, oh, you think you've got a difficult production. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll make it even worse for myself. I don't think it was that, but it was some, you know, some ego thing, I'm sure. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting, though, the parallels mm. between the two, whether it was intentional or not. You know, the fact that they both went off to do these extraordinarily, extraordinarily ambitious and troubled uh, films in the jungle. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. what else have we got? The rope bridge cost $1 million to build. So that rope bridge mm. sequence, which is, I mean, just extraordinary. Mm. Um incredible sequence where they've got to get these trucks over this long rope bridge which is falling apart it's in the middle of a huge storm the river is a torrent underneath and the bridge is swinging back and forth and of course you know the i don't know have we got you explained in the plot right that the um these four characters get sent to this remote place in the mountains in Colombia. It's supposed Columbia. to be Colombia, yeah, yeah. and uh, there were, there's an oil plant there, and there's a, 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 an American oil company that's sort of like turning a blind eye to the regime that is in place in the country. With mm. there's lots of shots of posters of like El Presidente, and yeah. you know, it's basically like a military regime or something. Yes. And uh, but the oil company are sort of like, yeah, never mind. This is a great opportunity for us to. Um, you know, produce all this oil and make loads of money, and it's probably all very corrupt, and mm. there's no health and safety or anything like that. It's a total nightmare, mm. and the 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 refinery explodes. You know, the 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 oil well explodes dramatically, and there's like massive fireballs, people burning alive and stuff. Yeah. And um, the only way to put out the fire is to use dynamite, but the dynamite has been stored incorrectly and all of the night you know with dynamite i didn't know this mm. yeah with the, with dynamite you've got to keep turning the the sticks of dynamite otherwise mm. the nitroglycerine will leak out mm. and nitroglycerine is volatile and will explode if you sort of nudge it or drop it or something mm. and the nitroglycerine the dynamite is like on the other side of the jungle and there's the only way they they can get it from a to b to the to the site to stop the 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 out of control burning of the oil well is to use these trucks and to basically drive it through the jungle so that's the that's the kind of dramatic element that they these trucks are carrying this these very volatile explosives and they've yeah they've got to go through the jungle and it's one nightmare problem after another and mm. then they get to this this bridge which is th really long and swaying in the most dramatic way and all the mm. wood um, is all falling apart and the bridge is falling apart as they're going over it. Mm. 
Uh, so that bridge scene, oh my God, I mean, it's just edge of the seat stuff. And mm. because there's two trucks, you see the first truck go through it and it's, you know, nail biting. And then the next truck's got to do it. There's a, like, the, the scene happens again, yeah. but even more dramatically. Yeah. Incredible. Is one before it starts raining and then one is in the rain? Is that, no, they're know? both in the rain. Oh, they're yeah. both in the rain. So Yeah, the, the storm starts as they're going down a hill, oh, okay. s essentially sliding down this mud hill, which... I mean, you, you texted to me, like, I find it hard to believe that the nitroglycerin didn't explode. And, yeah. yeah. Me too, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit strange. I mean, apparently it's teetering like this. and Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't And matter. especially I the bit care. where they go down the, that mud hill and the, the, the truck's kind of like going down mm. like a, a very sharp angle. Mm. Um, so, yeah, of course, I mean, it probably, we talk about realism, but I think there's a couple yeah. of moments there where, they kind of were a bit liberal with the with the realism, but still, yeah. it's like as an as a device, it's incredibly tense, really on the edge of the seat, very uncomfortable viewing. Yeah, I think I think um, the filmmaking was so good. It's one of those where the filmmaking's so good that you don't care. I mean, it didn't spoil my enjoyment of it at all. Yeah. But it's the idea that the oil, that thing is that fire is raging all the time that they're traveling two hundred miles. That's just yes. raging the whole time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. Exactly, and it's so it's a race against time. They've got to stop it. And this town, I can't remember the name of it. Poor Veneer. Poor Veneer. Yeah. This shanty town, essentially. Yeah, very much so. Relies completely on on the oil uh, well. Yes. And yeah. so the whole the future of this entire town is at stake, and all these these people, these poor people who live there. Yeah. So it's the the guys are on this journey because it's their only ticket out because the payment mm. for it will be enough to get them out of the out of there they've gone there because they've escaped in order to hide from you know they've all committed crimes in various ways and they've gone there to escape mm. to hide That's but it. it's kind of out of the frying pan into the fire kind of thing because poor veneer is a total nightmare yeah and it's just poverty and it's awful and um so they're desperate to get out and this this turns out to be the only way they can do it is they accept this job Mm. They they all pass the audition, as it were, to be yeah. the the truck drivers, and so this yeah. is their only chance to get out and to you know to escape this nightmare. But also yeah. at the same time that you know the yeah the oil well is on fire, so they've got to try and race against time to to try and stop that as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah we were doing trivia, weren't we? <laughs> so yeah, we were doing trivia about the 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 bridge. Cost one million dollars to build. Yeah. Um. After yeah. it was completed, the original river went almost completely dry for the first time in its history due to a drought. The bridge had to be torn down and a new location was found in Mexico. The bridge had to be re rebuilt at the cost of another million dollars. Yeah, I, to I can't totally verify that, but um, if we just say at least half of that's true, <laughs> and it cost a million dollars to build. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I understand that, yeah. um, I mean, uh, listening to that freaking conversation, I think he talks about it in that, in that conversation with Mark Maron, that mm. uh, the trucks actually fell off the bridge a lot yes. during the during the filming. I mean, y y you know, the the trucks are teetering in the film, but mm. during the during the actual filming, they did fall off a number of times and they fell into the water. They f w got washed downstream. It's it's a miracle that the drivers weren't killed. You know, it just happened again and again and again. And they had to Absolutely. fish the trucks out. You know, fix them up, send them back over the bridge. The water, I understand, was was even fake, or that they added extra water th with hoses to to yeah. create that that sort of torrent of water under the bridge. Yeah, because yeah. I think there was there were there were rainstorms, but then they'd had to abandon the shop for whatever reason, so they had to try and recreate it. I mean, it was well, <laughs> what a nightmare! I mean, what an absolute nightmare! And then if you see that that it was a box office failure. I mean, yeah. you can see, you can understand why people wouldn't want to trust this guy with lots of money again, mm. you know, with his mm. personality. You know, great yeah. filmmaker for sure, but I'm sure he wasn't, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't easy to deal with. And then he's doing all this crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you give us just a couple? Another, another one a couple is more the, bits of trivia and then the, the, the production of the film, it was actually handled by two studios, which is a bit weird. Mm. And this is another reason why the film flopped. Is that so it was Paramount and and Universal, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Somehow they collaborated on this project, 
which again is a sign of the times that it was crazy. No one knew, really knew what was going on. Mm. And I understand that Paramount thought that uh, Universal would handle the the sort of um, promotion of it, mm. and Universal thought Paramount would handle it, and like no one was communicating with each other. Freakins in the jungle spending loads of money and it's just like mm. total disaster yeah. and that also is the reason why maybe a lot of people haven't seen it since because the film was wrapped up in a lot of legal issues in, uh, about who actually owned it Absolutely. Um, which is why it didn't get a proper dvd release and maybe that's why it wasn't shown on the tv as much as it could have been and why we hadn't heard of it really yeah i mean i hadn't really heard of it just from this documentary i saw like i said mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, incredible. Um, yeah, just a little bit of stuff about Friedkin and the and the studio. When early test screenings were poor, Friedkin demanded that Paramount pay for full-scale new filming instead of inserting scenes that the studio felt would help clarify some elements of the story. Paramount nixed both any new production funds and their plans to actively market and advertise the film, which contributed to it being a box of, massive box office failure. This is something I've seen in films before. Um, the studio will uh, ask, demand, uh, try and persuade the director to film quite commercial scenes. If it's a film where, where, where they know the director is going to shoot a lot of film, they say, well, can you give us a few commercial scenes and then you can do your more artistic scenes and then we'll, we'll decide later what goes where. And what they'll often do is, is take a commercial scene, even if it doesn't quite seem to fit, they know what sells, basically. And like I say, as I get older, I do start to realize why they do that. Mm. And I don't knock them for that per se, you know. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, cool. it's the movie business. It's like the yeah, music business. It's, it's, a, it's a contradiction in terms. The music yeah. business, the film business, because it's art versus commerce. And it's always going to, they're always going to clash, aren't they? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple of other factoids. Mm. Um, well, like, apparently, about 50 people uh, had to leave the film during the making of it. They had to leave and go home through injury or malaria. There was an outbreak of malaria. Friedkin, him, Friedkin himself caught malaria. He lost 24 kilograms of weight. Yeah, that's for British, that's four stone. For American, what would that be? What's four times 14? 56 pounds. That's a lot. I mean, that's about a third of his body weight. Yeah. Probably yeah. maybe a quarter, depending on his size. But yeah. that is a lot. <laughs> I know. It's really amazing. There's food poisoning, wasn't there? Gangrene. People had injuries and they went gangrenous. Gangrene, for yeah. goodness sake. Horrible. Horrible. Health and safety disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? There, there was something else I was going to say then as well. I can't remember what it is. Anyway. It'll come back to me. Freakin names this as the most difficult, but also the favourite of all of his films. And I wonder if even there's a connection there. I wonder if Coppola might say Apocalypse Now is his favourite film or one of his favourite films. Yeah. Maybe, maybe yeah. when the dust has settled and you've recovered from <laughs> the trauma of making it, maybe you look back and you think that's completely unique, you know. We yeah. Can, especially now, you can never do that. You know, if Coppola looks back to Apocalypse Now, Freakin looks back to Sorcerer from, you know, 2023. He's like, well, we know that would never happen. So thank God I was able to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing, isn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, Scheider said that because he was the leading man or because he was the sort of uh, star of the, the film, that he was able to dig his heels in hmm. and kind of, um, like, Freakin kept firing people hmm. as well. Yeah. He kept firing people because he, you know, they weren't doing his bidding. Yeah, basically, and, it's a war. And isn't it? Scheider basically said to him, "Look, you got to stop firing people because I can't go to the airport to say goodbye to any more people." <laughs> yes. He kept, you know, he kept having to go and say these tearful goodbyes to these people he'd worked with, you know. And so he's like, "You can't do this anymore." I'd love to. Mm. I wish there was a documentary about the making of the film. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but it's interesting to compare. Again, we'll go back to Jaws. Jaws was a, a difficult production, but I think the crew weren't necessarily angry with Spielberg. Spielberg was not dictatorial, it seems. I mean, he probably isn't even now. I mean, I mean, what do we know? But certainly then, you know, he's only 26, 27. Equally, in Apocalypse Now, I think Francis Ford Coppola was probably somewhere in between Spielberg and uh, Freakin. Apparently did have an explosive temper at times. And I, I mean, he famously fired Harvey, Harvey Keitel, but I don't think that was a 
that was a spur of the moment. I think that was a practical decision. But mm. yeah, there's just all kinds of chaos going on. And um, Freakin said that Scheider was much easier to work with on French Connection before he became a star. And, right. Okay, that's his version. But from what we know of Freakin, we might side with Roy Scheider perhaps a little bit there. I mean, it's it sort of those two accounts actually do go together because Freakin saying, oh, Scheider was easy to work with before he became a star. And uh, uh, Freakin saying that. And Scheider is saying, the only way I could actually negotiate with Freakin was to threaten to, to quit the film. And he couldn't tell me what to do or do certain things because he needed me. Mm. So, like, the, uh, Scheider's star power happened to be his only bargaining tool and negotiating tool. So from Freakin's point of view, it's like, oh, you know, who are you? You're an upstart. Yeah. And from Scheider's point of view, it's like, well, I'm going to use every tool I can to try and maintain some level of control or just level of safety in this crazy yeah. adventure. So yeah. it's true. They're both, both accounts are true. Yeah. Yeah. But the telling quote, what you said earlier, you know, Jaws was like a tea party compared to this. You said it was like a picnic, according <laughs> a picnic, to the notes. Yeah. Oh, a yeah. picnic. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, we're going to pick one more each, and then we'll just because there isn't too much plot, it won't take too long to go through the basics of the plot. So yeah, one from you, one from me, and then we'll move on. Um, yeah, there's I'm a lot to think. choose from. <laughs> there's a lot to mm. choose from here. Yeah, there was the, the, we talked about the explosions. Mm. So there, there are quite a lot of um, pretty impressive explosions in this, uh, including right at the beginning of the film uh, when the the scene in Jerusalem. Mm. Um, where there's uh, these two sort of Palestinian freedom fighters, terrorists, whatever. Um, they, uh, I guess they, I don't know what the building is that they're blowing up, but they they blow up a building. And in the in the notes, Anthony, you've mm -hmm. said that um, <laughs> the explosion was so big that it broke the windows of a city mayor, uh, city's mayor's the, the, house. the mayor's office located six meters away but i think it was probably a little bit further away than six meters oh well i copied that directly yeah, it must be six miles <laughs> it's got to be yeah right no i didn't, write, just these, uh, no, I didn't write these so <laughs> for the audio can we for the audio can we do the professional version of that yeah okay six so <laughs> so the the explosion was so big that uh it s smashed the windows of the mayor's house which was something like six kilometers or six miles away. Mm. Um, and there, uh, I understand that there was also an, a genuine explosion that happened in Jerusalem while they were making the, yeah. the film there. And Freakin took the chance to do a bit of documentary filmmaking. Of and actually, course he did. <laughs> some of the shots that ended up in the film are real shots of the aftermath of that real explosion. So mm. it's, yeah, again, using that word visceral again, it's definitely visceral. Some of the... Yeah. I was kind of quite shocked by some of the graphic violence. You see burning bodies and things. I don't think the burning bodies are real. Yeah. But some of the special effects are quite sort of brutal. A lot of, you know, like bodies flying through the air and blood and, and, and stuff like that, which is like proper 70s violent special effects. Something yeah. That, quite, I, yeah. No, go on, go on. I was going to say just something quite kind of brutal and mm. raw about those mm. special effects from the 70s. The colour of the blood. You know, they hadn't quite got the the, the right colour of, you know, mm. like blood in 70s films is like a bit too scarlet. Yes, yeah. It's supposed to be claret, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, a dark but, red. But, it, but it's a bit too bright. Yes, and yes. so it's just got that kind of 70s vibe to it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I'm sure, I can't, again, I can't bring anything to mind, but I'm sure that's happened before. Sometimes they've been filming war films and then some real conflict and the director just says, oh, well, this is even better than what we're doing, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to be flippant about that, but again, we benefit from that, from him yeah. being a bit crazy and thinking, well, I'll film a real war or a you know, real fighting or a real bombing. Yeah. I mean, you know? Taxi Driver, there are scenes in the streets. Yes. You know, like there's that, there's that guy w pacing down the street. Oh, oh I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill oh, yeah, her. Yeah. Oh, fucking kill her. He's yeah. going down the street. That was just a real guy walking down yeah. the street and they, they just like shot him as he went past. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, even something very innocuous, um, when we just reviewed Deliverance, we were talking about, obviously, the dueling banjos. Yeah. One of the locals just started dancing, and they hadn't, because they weren't actors, they hadn't told him to dance. Yeah. They left it in, because it was, made some weird comment about how the city boys and the locals, everyone can be uh, united through music. So, mm. there you go. Mm. There you mm. go. All right. Um, 
now with the plot we can just quickly wash through there's four vignettes if you like so that's how we see these four people the first one is uh nilo or nilo mm. i've just got here. an elegantly dressed man enters a flat in uh, vera cruz i think that's in mexico yes he immediately executes the unsuspecting tenant with a silenced revolver and casually walks out the building and that is all we get so obviously we get to see cold-blooded killer you know no messing around um, yeah he's an assassin he, 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 i don't understand his storyline i have to say yeah I, I i don't think we're supposed to to really understand it yeah i think it's just again as we said earlier it's just the idea of these four guys and they're all apart from the frenchman the other three are all quite dangerous in a way they're danger quite dangerous people I mean, roy scheider as well roy scheider's character jackie yeah. isn't it yeah. um so the, there's some similarities if you like but yeah i think that's deliberately deliberately uh ambiguous because he he turns up at uh the this town and he's kind of um he's sort of bribing the guys at the border or whatever when he arrives on the plane he's all mm -hmm. smartly dressed and he sort of bribes them and he's sort of a bit of a vip and stuff and i don't know why he's there he, apparently he's mm -hmm. only supposed to be there for a, for a short time he's just dropping in Mm. Um, I don't know if it's because there's that German guy mm. who is an ex-Nazi. He was yeah. like a, a a marshal in the Third Reich. Yeah, and one of the guys in this town. Yeah, who who does get spoiler alert? Yeah, we are going to be spoiling guys. Sorry, <laughs> he, he gets killed by by Nilo. Um, I I think maybe he kills him just so he can replace him in the mission to get yeah. out. But I don't really know why he's in the in the village because if he's an assassin. And he seems to get away with the murder at the beginning. He just sort of strolls out of the building into mm. the courtyard. Mm. So I don't really know why he's there. But anyway, he's an interesting sort of character, this sort of ruthless assassin. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's something quite um, attractive, attractive in the sense of, in, of a viewer watching a film, when you just get a guy who's very elegantly dressed and just does it so matter-of-factly. There's something intriguing about that. It's a bit of James Bond kind of vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. So the second one is in um, Jerusalem. So Palestinian militants, as you said earlier, very interesting. Uh, you, they're freedom fighters or terrorists, depending your slant on it. Mm. Um, they cause an explosion near the Damascus Gate in Jerusalem. Then they're surrounded by the Israeli Defense Forces. Two of them are killed, and the one who survives is Kassem, Kassem who yeah. obviously is our character. Um, I love the crowd shots. What... I think one of the things they took from Itali from Italian or French, European, let's call it, is this thing about expressive faces. Because in um, Italian neorealism, Fellini, for example, Rossellini, um, you often get the camera lingering on someone who's just got a really interesting or expressive face. Mm. And I noticed there was a little bit of that. Um, I noticed uh, the, the camera zooming in very slowly from above. Again, it's right. definitely got some hallmarks of this new Hollywood, which took its cue from these European films of decades earlier. Yeah, yeah that's it, the, it's the, great stuff. Yeah, the the four hundred blows, the French film. Yes, there's a lot of that in that as well, like lingering on the faces of children. You know, yeah. these sort of like these orphans sort of delinquent kids, and you see all these. There's a scene of them in the cinema watching a film, mm. and the, the the camera pans across their faces. It's a fantastic shot. These like funny looking kids yeah but yeah a lot of that yeah yeah definitely okay then the third one is his um victor the frenchman that guy had such a familiar face but i was looking through his filmography and i don't know is he famous was he famous tv tv in the uh 80s i think he played um inspector may gray oh, okay. on french television so you oh, might have okay. seen him as a as a as uh may gray may, uh, may gray Migret, yes, yes. So his wife is reading um, a poetry book. I think she's editing it. Um, there's a lovely shot. Uh, again, th this is another thing that we're, we're talking about. She's reading in the background, and then he's just tying his tie in the mirror. And there's a close-up on his face, and you're seeing the mirror. You're seeing what he's seeing as he's looking through the mirror. That's very evocative of this period, definitely. Mm. And he gets this watch. Uh, we'll, we'll see that a bit later, won't we? He gets a watch with an anniversary de dedication. Yeah, um, that, they, they, they they are obviously deeply in love, and it's mm. very romantic. And 
you know, she she gives him this gold watch to celebrate 10 years together and mm. he, they're clearly deeply in love with each other. But he's a very naughty uh, banker. Yeah. Who apparently he's, he's guilty of fraud. Yeah. And the authorities are, you know, going to get him. And his partner... Um, is his, his brother-in-law? It's her yeah. brother, yeah. Yeah, that's right. His yeah. his business partner, you know, he's... Um, what's his name? Victor is saying, look, you're going to, you know, you've got to sort this out, blah, blah, blah. And his, his business partner's basically like, you know, there's nothing we can do. We're screwed. Yeah. And then he shoots himself. Yeah. And Victor like go, discovers him in the car park in his car after he's shot himself. That's and it. at this point, Victor realizes, I think he goes back into the restaurant, has one last look at his wife or something, or leaves a note for her yeah. and literally runs down the road That's it. away from this very expensive looking restaurant, which is probably somewhere in the, in the, in the nice part of the banlieue in the Northwest of, Paris or something Paris. like that. Yeah, it's amazing. One minute he's in the restaurant, and the next minute, as you say, he's having a last look at his wife, who he's probably never going to see again. And we know in the end he yeah. doesn't see her again. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very um, it's very shocking. We just get these four. I'll I'll go into the fourth one in a sec. But we get these four vignettes. We don't know anything else about these people, but they're all very shocking in their own ways. Mm. So then the fourth one, so there's an Irish, I guess, Irish-American gang. It's in New Jersey, which is actually where Scheider is from in real life. They rob a Catholic church, which I don't think they know, do they, that it's it's connected to a Italian mafia crew. I don't know. I think they, maybe they do. Oh, but do this, they know that? Right. This church is a front for this Italian gang. Oh, okay. It's right. like a money, money laundering front or something, and they're in the back counting the money while there's a wedding going on. Yeah. Interesting detail, the bride in this sort of, this oh, Italian-American yeah. wedding, the bride's got a big bruise on her, yeah. on her face. Yeah, and again, it's not explained, but it says enough. It tells you something, you know, we need to know about that world. Yeah, and obviously they're making a point that this, I'm sure this happens in real life. I mean, we know money laundering does, but this this has been linked with the, the church and the mafia have been linked, and Coppola did that in Godfather 3, of course, um, yeah. 15 years or so after this, 1990, I think it was. Anyway, the gang members get away, and they're in this car, and um, they have an argument, and Jackie, who's Roy Scheider, is driving the car, and it crashes, and all the others are killed except him, but he's, he's got really very serious injuries. And um, there's a shot which, if it was done now, might be a bit of a cliche, but I don't think it was in those days, which is obviously the money covered in blood. Um, you, love, yeah. you love Taxi Driver. One of my favourite bits is when Sport gives Travis, is it a $1 bill or a $5? And it's, sort I don't of, know, yeah. and it's crumpled up and it's an entire right. symbol for that seamy world that he's both fascinated by and wants to perhaps wants to avoid or wants to believe that he's better than, you know? Yeah, because Iris, like, you know, there's a scene where clearly Sport is... Uh, he's all rough. Um, he's being rough with her. Iris. Yeah, he's yeah. manhandling her in the back of the taxi. Yeah. And Travis is bothered by it. You can see just because of his eyes. Like, mm. great eye acting by De Niro. Lots yeah. of, you know, that looking and looking away. And and Sport basically throws down this crumpled bill and he says, you know, forget about it or something. Yeah. That's and he's then at the, representative. Yeah. yeah, at the end of the shift, he's going through his notes and he finds that crumpled bill and it really obviously has stuck with him. Yeah. Uh, so the blood on the money, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, maybe a bit on the nose, as they'd say in, in, uh, in America. But again, from our eyes now, you know, I don't know how many times that had been done back then. We don't know. But uh, you hit on something important, by the way. We talked about Scheider's eyes, Robert De Niro's eyes. Just did a two-parter on Michael Caine because he turned 90 in March and we were talking about that in his best roles is just something in the eyes. You don't have to do anything else. Well, there's, there's no, one of those, you know, the you know, like in, mm. inside the actor's studio, mm. there's a scene from that where he's saying, you know, the thing about it, I'll give you one tip. I'll give you one bit of advice. Right. Mm. And he says that in a scene when there's the camera here on one side and you're talking to one person, he says, you look in the eyes, you look into the left eye. If the camera's on the left, you look into the left eye. If the camera's on the right, you look in the right eye, you know, and then so he obviously is aware of how the camera's picking up on his eyes. Yes. But I think De Niro's got to be the, the king of the eye actors. Maybe. That's yeah. his whole shtick, isn't it? It's like, you know, yeah. looking down, looking up, looking down again, yeah. Yeah. looking away. Yeah. A lot of that eye acting. Yeah. 
But that's the wonder of movies, isn't it? That you can get right up close in someone's face and it, the acting, rather than it being about big theatrical gestures, it's just like mm. the way you look down, look up, look down again, you know. Yeah, and it's the eyes of experience as well, isn't it? You can see a lot of history. You can see history yeah. in those eyes, yeah, yeah. All right, so in this uh, final vignette, the wounded priest turns out to be the brother of Carlo Ricci, an Italian mafia kingpin. So obviously they're after Jackie. So we set up this idea that there's four fellas. So they're in Port Vineer in uh, Colombia. As we said, just some, I love all the close-ups of just things like insects, you know, when they show these quite exotic insects that you wouldn't get in uh, where we come from, I, guess, I suppose. Yeah. I like the use of the political slogans because later on, as the oil well is exploding, you can see in the background plaster on the wall, it's, it said, uh, Unidos hacia el futuro, which in Spanish is united towards the future. And because it, it's such a cliche, you know, it's such a cliched political slogan, it works better, you know? Mm. Like we're all in it together. It's, it's the equivalent of that. United towards the future, or mm. in other words, you will do exactly what we tell you to do. Yeah, yeah, you're you're yeah. united by our our leadership and our orders, you know? It's like, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an order, isn't it, to be united? Yeah, united towards a future where we have complete control and we give you just enough that you don't revolt. <laughs> yeah, the, but even then, even, the even then, yeah. even then, because there's the scene. I mean, we're going to get to it when after the oil uh, well has exploded and and the, the the bodies are brought back to the village and basically mm -hmm. there's an uprising and yeah, there is, the, yeah. the 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 army or whatever the arm the the police come in and mm -hmm. kill loads of the people who were fighting and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, that that basically, yeah, we can get to that now if you want. Um, yeah, so the, the economy is heavily reliant on the, the oil company. So there's obviously points being made about how economics works and the economics of poverty, basically. And then there's just great scenes that you can see, you know, there, as you mentioned earlier, the sweating. It's just so, it's so evocative. And you see these villages, which look strange to us, you know, if you or if you're coming in from the city. They look strange, these people. They look like people that you don't normally see. And not saying that's better or worse, just saying they look different. Mm. And um, this is where I think Sh Scheider is possibly, for me, at his best, is sitting at a bar, you know, having a whiskey or something and just looking like he's got the weight of the world on his shoulders, you know. There's that fantastic, fantastic moment, exactly, where he's sitting at the bar, he's, eat he's drinking probably a uh, awful beer that probably costs a lot more than he can afford mm. and he's staring up at a poster on the wall of the bar yeah. it's a coca-cola advert and it's like a a white blonde american woman mm. you know that sort of 50s image yeah this what blonde american woman in a short skirt she's leaning reaching towards a, a bottle of coke and he's just like staring just thirsting over this this yeah. this woman and the camera lingers on 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 her legs and her bum and it then lingers on the fact her hand is reaching out to grab this coca cola bottle yeah you know and it's just like he's just thirsting over the woman but also thirsting over like his freedom and his liberty and like you yeah. know all those things that he doesn't have access to yeah, yeah but yeah the, the the grimy uh shanty town that they live in mm. the conditions that they're living in and Scheider gets roughed up by the cops, doesn't he? They they kind of turn up, yeah, and they can spot immediately that he isn't who he claims to be because they've all been given like false passports and they've given oh, yeah. they've been given Spanish names. His name is yeah. Dominguez. He, he can't speak, speak a word. Spanish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they 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 rough him up and they and they take him down to the police station and basically say, look, you know, we'll let you go, but we're from now on we're going to take thirty percent of all your money. Okay, so he's getting shaken down for. Yeah. his money mm -hmm. and i think the one of the points they're making uh, i think there's something that people accept now that they wouldn't then is this this way of doing business ma this mafia style way of doing legitimate business as well or supposedly i.e government or you know respectable corporations that they do actually more or less operate like the mafia you know they take a piece and as long as you stay in line they look after you if you like protect you you know, by giving you a wage or whatever. So yeah. it's very good points made about that. Uh, we mentioned earlier that there's a series of amazing explosions. I mean, just remarkable, really incredible. Again, almost a nod. Well, later on, there's Apocalypse Now. There's an explosion at the beginning. You just can't believe how enormous it is. And, and um, 
so this oil well explodes, as we said, and then we get something we'd said earlier, this rather shaky plot about this very delicate, this very delicate uh, dynamite that can somehow survive uh, bri bridges <laughs> into actual rain. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I don't care. No. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's great, though, because like every single turning, every rock that they go over in, in these trucks could mm. send them all to smithereens you know yeah so yeah it's a great great way of ramping up the tension in that mm. video that we talked about before that we both just happened to see because mm. it's one of the only videos about sorcerer that you can find on youtube mm. um there's an interesting thing that hitchcock said about the difference between what was it suspense and shock i think yeah. Something like that. So shock is, in, in cinematic terms, is when a bomb goes off under a table and no one expects it. Pow! Yeah. Like when the oil well explodes. But then suspense is when the audience knows that the bomb is under the table, but the part, you know, the, the, the protagonists in the, the film don't know that it's there. Yeah. And the audience have no way of telling the protagonists that there's a bomb that's going to go off. Yeah. And yeah. so there's always this potential for a huge explosion to happen at any time. So the film, you know, really cranks that up to 11 yeah. um, in the sense that at any moment they could all just be blown to pieces. Yeah. Hitchcock only ever let that bomb go off once. I won't say which film it is just in case, but, mm. but he only ever did that once and he regretted it. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's much better if the bomb doesn't actually go off or perhaps goes off at some other time that you're not expecting. Yeah, it's too yeah, obvious yeah, yeah. to let it go off. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the, we hear this spoken announcement around the village. We need four drivers, um, and these four guys get the parts, so to speak. Nilo then kills and replaces this Marquez figure, this mysterious the German. Figure. Yeah, and Nilo's also mysterious. Mm. And so we end up with these four guys going on this journey. Um, There's a great kind of A-team sequence, mm -hmm. the A-team before the A-team. Oh yeah, where, building the truck. Yeah, yeah. Where they like doing up the trucks? It's like a pretty good. Um, what do you call that montage? Yes, yes, yes. Of of them like you know, like replacing the the parts of the engines and yeah. yet more shots of like um, nuts being bolted on and oil yeah. and people wiping the sweat from their brows and it's all they don't seem to sleep. They just seem to do that throughout the night of just like yeah. doing the repairing and fixing these trucks that look like incredible monsters uh, the, particularly the truck called sorcerer mm. which has got this sort of big kind of set of teeth on the front of it like the, yeah. i don't know if they designed it specifically the, for the film or if that was already a truck that you know existed but it looks monstrous yeah yeah well there's a very early um, spielberg film that was a tv film that became a cinema jewel yeah. Jewel, yeah. Where the truck has got a personality. You know, it's almost got a face, if you like. So yeah. that, that's a great idea. Yeah, this Leviathan, you know, this uh, immovable object. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's very, very good, isn't it? And um, the sound effects as well of the trucks. Yeah. Uh, the, the, yeah. They, again, something s that makes me think of Star Wars, you know, the, the sound design of Star Wars is one of the great things about the, 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 the series. Mm. Um, and a lot of those noises, like Chewbacca, for example, they they took like the sound of a walrus and mixed it with the sound of a lion roaring and all these mm. other things. The same thing with the engine sounds for the trucks that they actually have tigers roaring and other mm. animal sounds have been used to m create the sound of the engines, which is why they have that oh, incredible sound, like that kind of sound to them. Oh, that's very interesting because Spielberg um, for Jewel, when the truck's going over the down the mountain at the very end, dying essentially. And obviously yeah. the driver dies. He used a sound effect from King Kong as uh, King Kong is dying. And then he reused it for Jaws as the shark is dying. So there's a through line. In addition, uh, my favorite film of all time, Raging Bull, it's number one on my flick chart. Mm -hmm. um, they used animal noises for that. So elephants braying and hyenas and things. And if you, when you know it's there and you watch those fight sequences, it does add something. This sort of screeching sounds, it, it makes it sound more intense. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, animal be, noises. What, what would be funny is if they put the sound of a dolphin in there. Oh, you know, yeah. that kind of like that really ridiculous <laughs> noise that dolphins make. In in yeah. Monty Python, um, in this TV series, you know, the, the, the opening shot 
where mm. Palin is like crawling across a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a desert island it's, and it's mm. and there's one where he goes through the jungle and they insert all of the different animal sounds so the the poor guy is being chased by these different animals there's like a lion roaring and a you know like different animals chasing him and, and one of the sound effects is the sound of a dolphin <laughs> So that's actually before all this stuff that we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah. That's late 60s. Isn't it? You can imagine them doing that afterwards, but yeah, that's interesting they did that before. <laughs> it would be great, though, if like, in the middle of, while the engine's revving, you hear these, Rrr, and then in the background, there's like, you know, that funny dolphin noise. That would have that would have been good. Well, that's that small difference between, uh, you know, seriousness and comedy, isn't it? You can turn it into comedy with one tiny tweak, you know? That's... <laughs> That's probably the best comedy, isn't it, in a way, sometimes, yeah. is when you take something that's almost perfectly serious just for that tiny little, tiny yeah, little tweak. Push it a little bit too far. Just push yeah. it over the cliff. That's yeah. it. Push it over the cliff, so to speak. All right. Um, so uh, what can we say about this journey? So there's not a lot of plot. It's, it's all – obviously, there's themes of four people trapped together, personality conflicts coming up. We yeah. never really get the feeling that they become friends, but they have to work together. You know, they're they, they, to work together. Most of the time, they are at odds with each other. Um, I mean, like Sca um, Jackie Scanlon, um, Roy Scheider's character, is in the truck with uh, Nilo, and he hates him. He, there's a good bit where he's like, listen, you know, I can't recreate it, but he's basically like, listen, pal, you know, don't give me any of your bullshit, you know, all this mm -hmm. sort of thing. He really lays it on the line. And the, the, the Palestinian, what's his name? Ha I can't remember his name. Kesem. Kesem. He hates... Kas oh, sorry. Kasem. Kasem. He hates Nilo because Nilo killed his, his friend who was going to be on the mission. Yes. And so they're all at odds with each other. And most of the time, they, they seem to hate each other. There's only one moment where things seem to cool down. Mm. And it's when uh, Victor and Kasem, Kasem yeah. uh, are in the truck, and they, they've been, they've you know, seem to have gone through the worst of it. They've got over the bridge and so on. They've got past some that big obstacle, mm. and uh, they start kind of chatting about their lives and stuff. And Victor shows him the watch that his wife has given to him, and he's like, "Oh, yeah, this is from my wife." You know, blah yeah. blah blah. I've got this beautiful wife back in Paris, and at that very moment the tire bursts and like in the just in a matter of seconds the truck is over the edge and pow when That's you it. least expect it yeah. so yeah very cruel just when you're starting to get to know the characters just when they start to make friends it's like pam done yeah. no you know the the and that's kind of Friedkin's maybe pessimistic maybe realistic view of life of yeah. fate that you know death is in store and it can happen any moment. There's no mm. right time for it. It's always going to happen at yeah. an unexpected moment, you know? You know, maybe we've all got smaller versions of that. Just when things are working well, that's when, you know, life bites you on the arse, basically. Yeah. You know, so it's an, it's an example of that. It's pretty cynical, but I mean, I'm sure that happens in life, you know? Yeah. You know, that sort of strange timing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Mm. But it, it's it's certainly again visceral experience when you know they're, they're kind of going on he's like this is you know watch blah 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 and then suddenly pow poof, it takes you by surprise and so you know again in that sort of the the excitement of the cinematic experience it's, it's terrifically well done yeah it is it's brilliant and there's so much of that as well right at the beginning although we said those vignettes they're all quite shocking just violence out of nowhere you know yeah things yeah, yeah, snuffed yeah. out in a second yeah what about the yeah. tree across the the road so the, there's like several yeah. things they've got to get around these bending roads and there's moments where it looks like the truck's going to go off the edge and they just manage to get around before the the road collapses and then they've got to go and then the storm comes in they've got to slide down this sort of steep slope and they've got mm -hmm. to get over the bridges as we said and and the second truck just manages to get over the bridge before the whole bridge gets washed away down the river. There's a the mm. scene where they're halfway through the river and one of them falls in mm. and the other one doesn't know he's fallen in. And he's still driving the truck forwards. He's going to get crushed and yeah. he doesn't. And then like they get the cable from the truck and attach it to a tree. And then suddenly a big load of branches gets washed down the river and they get trapped in the branches. And yeah. it's like, 
one thing, they get over one thing and almost instantly some other life-threatening thing comes along. And so after they've both gone over this bridge and survived, they get through the jungle and they get to a point where there's a massive tree that's fallen down in the road. Hmm. And uh, yeah, Roy Scheider's character kind of loses it there and he starts hacking away at the jungle mm. um, and beating the ground and stuff. Yeah. And they, they decide that they need to use some of the explosives to, to blow this tree up. And I love that sequence of like, they create this little pulley system mm. so they can tie, there's a bag of sand and, um, and the tree explodes in the, it's such a great explosion, pow, and just bits of wood flying everywhere. Mm. leaving a perfect gap for them to to go through yeah. yeah were there injuries during that do we know during that scene I'd, not that i know of no yeah. I, I don't know either but I, I can't imagine there wouldn't be somehow or the stress <laughs> in, stress involved in all that but, uh, yeah i said we're lucky we've got it you, now yeah yeah suffering so for their art. Th mm. there's also there's also the bandits as well that um yeah so, yeah. Just come into that. Yeah. So there's two okay. of them left. Yeah. There's two of them left. And then um, they're accosted by bandits who speak amazingly good English. I think that's for the benefit of the audience. Yeah. And one of them looks like Eric Clapton from like 1972. Have you noticed? <laughs> Didn't bust out the guitar. <laughs> He's got like a flat cap on and a beard. You know that period of, of Clapton? Oh, yeah. I guess it's like yeah. early 70s or something. Yeah. Around the time of his first album. Yeah. 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 So it's like Eric Clapton's there with a machine gun. And he's like, basically like, got this machine gun. Shall I shoot him? Shall I shoot him? Shall I shoot him? So they're all going to get, they're, they're both going to get killed any second now. Mm. And Nilo is pretending to be sick and he's got mm. a few tricks up his sleeve. Because they're saying in Spanish, aren't they? We'll kill them later. Yeah. But does Nilo, Nilo speak Spanish? Isn't he yeah. Spanish or Mexican? Yeah, 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 yeah I guess yeah. so. So he knows what's going on. Anyway, they kill them. Then Nilo gets wounded. So we just got Roy, Jackie <laughs> left. He's having all these hallucinations and flashbacks and so forth. Yeah, it's it's not bad. Yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good. I, I I love that bit. I have to say, mm. you know, I, I like it in films where characters lose their minds like that. Mm. Um, and it's though that, that bit where they the 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 truck kind of ends up in this weird landscape. That's mm. in the states. That's filmed somewhere in like New Mexico, I think. Uh, okay. Um, with these weird sort of towering like stone sort of uh, structures, you know, mm. and uh, he's losing it. And there's a great shot where he's kind of like, he's pale faced in the, in the, in the night, in the moonlight, driving the truck and losing mm. his mind. And he's going, what do you, what do you mean? You don't know, mm. which is like this, this sentence that's going round and round in his head. Mm. He's having flashbacks uh, to the, the car crash as well, isn't he? Yeah. He's seeing um, the car okay. crash again, the horror of that. He's, he's seeing Nilo uh, uh, dying on the floor, laughing, mm. the sound of Nilo's laughter. Yeah, and, the mocking and this, laughter. This, mm. this phrase keeps going around, what do you mean you don't know? What do you mean you don't know? Mm. Which is quite a good representation of, I suppose, what it's like for, for you to go go mad and delirious. Yeah. Um, and and there's, the, there's the shot, there's a, sorry, there's a shot yeah. with like pale blue and this lightning strike comes down. Mm. You, you see that reflected in the windscreen. It's a yeah. really great shot. Yeah, I think all those effects are brilliant. If I was going to be critical, I don't think Roy Scheider has got an enormous range, if I had to be honest. He's a bit, didn't totally buy it. I mostly bought it, that's fine. <laughs> mm. And the way it's shot, like I say, this whole film is just, just fabulous. Love it. Um, okay, mm. so then he has to carry this dynamite on foot. Yeah, because the truck kind of um, breaks down. Yeah. yeah the Two engine, miles to go. The engine dies, so he, he, then he collapses, and then we get this epilogue. Get another political slogan, which is four more years. Which, um, I've heard before, yeah, four more years. I think yeah. that was a slogan in American politics at some point. But, uh, mm. And, again, I think this is where Scheid is at his best, you know, looking bruised and battered. That's, that's the Roy Scheider that I probably like best. <laughs> yeah. Um, he gets a, a passport and he gets payment for this job. Well, does he get payment? They give him a check, but he's like, this is no good. What, what am I going to do with this? Go to a bank mm. and give them my uh, fingerprint? Because he's still wanted. 
he's still a oh, wanted yeah, man right, and he's right, like right. where can i go what can i do and he's like don't worry you know you get to this town i'll give you my word that they'll cash the check for you so he still hasn't even got the money at that point all right you know? and they i've got here they 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 offer him another job he's probably thinking oh is it gonna be like the last one <laughs> no this one's much easier yeah <laughs> um and uh, yeah, we are going to, if you've come this far, folks, and you haven't seen the end of this film, we're about to spoil it. Mm. I absolutely love this. Yeah, it's the woman scrubbing the floors and he asks her for a dance. And to me, to me, it looks like he just finally has a bit of peace. He's in the arms of this lady and they're just having a nice dance. She's not exactly the, the most beautiful woman you've ever seen. I mean, it's in, it, she's, she's probably like the most beautiful woman in the village, mm. but that's not saying that much. Yeah, and, I think that might be the point. I don't know. Yeah, it is. Yeah, definitely. It's simple. Yeah, that she's the sort of. I don't know quite what her status is in that town. Mm. You know, uh, but she's the woman who hangs around in the bar and she cleans the floor and maybe does a few other things. We don't know. But mm. um, yeah, he asks her for a dance, and there's that moment where he is at peace, dancing with her. And then, and then yeah, what happens then? Well, yeah. then um, we we see a shot of the outside of the of the bar a car a taxi pulls up and who gets out of the taxi but uh the uh the italian gangster who um whose brother was killed by scanlan's you know associates okay, yeah. this is the guy who 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 wants scanlan dead at all costs it's a bit of a marcellus wallace pulp fiction situation isn't it mm. where it's like you know if 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 he ends up in indochina i want a guy in a bowl of rice to pop a cap in his ass yeah, that's you it. know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they managed to find him even though he's gone to the edge, ends of the earth and they walk into the bar there is a gunshot mm. and that's the end of the film I felt like the gunshot uh, fitted with the music somehow. It was almost incorporated into the music. Maybe I remember that wrongly. Or there's a gunshot which makes the screen go to black and then you get the, f the title of the film again. Um, it seemed to go seamlessly into the music. That's what I remembered anyway. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But what do you think good. happens? Because we don't actually see what happens. So what do you think happens? Do you think they shoot him? Yeah, I mean, I don't have any other, any other more creative <laughs> ideas than the fact they shoot him, yeah. Well, they, maybe they didn't because... If you think about it, Scheider is the hero of the town, right? Because mm. he saved the town and he's given a hero's welcome. They're even saying, he says, you know, before he, want, he has the dance with the girl, he says, can I just have a minute? Mm. And the guy's like, they'll hold the plane for you. Meaning, you know, uh, you're the hero. So they'll, yeah, of course you can have a minute because you're the, you saved this town. There, there's like kids and stuff cheering him when he comes back. So uh, this guy's a hero. So if, if these, these sort of like dodgy guys come in and point a gun at, at him, maybe there's someone else in that room who's going to defend him. You feel like they might, someone, they might have a gun behind the bar. It seems like yeah. the sort of place where they would have protection, you know, weapons. Yeah. Yeah, so you're uh, right. Freaking Obviously said the that point in, is we don't know, isn't it? The point we're not supposed of to course. know. Yeah. Of course. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. We don't know. But it's, it's, it's not entirely uh, pessimistic at the end. And Friedkin said in that interview with Mark Maron that um, he thinks that actually it's n he's, he's not necessarily being killed at the end, that maybe um, the, the guys, um, you know, the, the, the locals defended him or something. Mm. Mm. I've just realised, of course, that, that's, that happens in French Connection as well. There's a shot and we don't know what it is. So he's using oh, really? the same. Ah, I just remembered that. It's Clever. obviously a Friedkin thing, yeah. Yep, yep. And then we get this, uh, obviously, Tangerine Dream, the music. And I noticed, did you, did you listen to the very end? You get a few seconds of the truck engine. Did you notice Oh, that? no. Yeah, if you go to the very end of the credits, just about 10 seconds of the truck engine. I don't know okay. why. Maybe because the truck is called Sorcerer, I guess. Yeah. That yeah, I think it. so. Yeah. All right. We haven't finished yet, folks. Two hours isn't, <laughs> enough, isn't enough. Um, no, we're just going to... How is this possible, Anthony? When it, I think it's the combination of the two of us that we just have too many things to say and too many tangents we always we've got going so many good fighting. references yeah but they're good yeah. references um all right themes um so we've got as i said earlier you know the thing with this oil well is the economics of the world and the economics of poverty is that the the big corporations taking most of the pie and mm. villagers get just enough and as you said they do revolt after that oil well explodes but I think my view of the relationship between the powerful and the proles, which includes us or includes me anyway, mm. um, is that 
we are given just enough that there isn't a revolution. That's my <laughs> conspiracy yeah. theorist idea. Um, it's not a conspiracy theory, really. Mm. I mean, it's that's that's a that's quite a well established um, cultural theory. Yeah, Gramsci, so, yeah. you know, that's Gramsci, like yeah. that's, that's basic Marxism, really, mm. or, or sort of like a, de a development of Marxism. The yeah. idea of the he hegemony or hegemony—I don't know how it's hegemony, pronounced, think, really. Yeah. That it's like you know, real domination is done with the um, what's the word for it? Chomsky consent of manufacturing of the people. consent, manufacturing yeah. consent. Yeah, that the, 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 you arrive at a situation where you know the the people who are in control create yeah. a system where the where the the people who are being controlled are kind of agree with it and perpetuate it. You know, yeah. I saw a really um, good meme online. It was something like it was obviously. You can use chess pieces are very effective, aren't they, for talking about the world? You know, we're the pawns and mm -hmm. the kings and queens, and then the, the bishops and the, the rooks and the intermediaries. And it's something, and you get, just see loads of pawns, and then in the corner is the king, and it says something like, They're closing in. Just, we're closing in very, very slowly. You know, we're closing in on the powerful, even though the gap between rich and poor is getting. Um, uh, wider psychologically people are waking up a little bit so that's this idea that you know they're they're in the corner and they've still got the power but we're just closing in very slowly mm. so it's a good image and on that video we both watched yeah there's a lot of stuff about control or maybe it was Friedkin I listened to about 15 minutes of him talking about sorcerer but the idea of um you can't control fate and that as we've seen you know life just throws you one obstacle after another um, what other themes have we got? Do you think? Um, um, yeah, fate, the human condition, mm -hmm. a critique of capitalism. Yes. Um, maybe something about you know the fact that um, uh, the, the world is is ultimately brutal and indifferent to our struggle. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite nihilistic, really. Yeah, you could say. But also, you know, like I said before, that statement about how in order to overcome great adversity and, and struggles people from diverse backgrounds do have to come together mm. i mean ultimately he does he does get to the end he does stop the fire mm. you know maybe he doesn't get killed at the end we don't know uh yeah. so it's not all completely pessimistic and nihilistic uh but also maybe i mean like what is the what is the that face that we see at the beginning? The face that is also engraved in the wall um, as the trucks are, are, are passing by. There's mm. there's some moments where like the native people are, are, are seen, mm. and they don't really help. You know, they kind of um, there's an old man, and they ask him which road is it to get to the the you know the refinery or whatever, and he's mm. like, oh, it's gone. Mm. And there's also that um, that guy who follows the trucks he's like joking around oh, i like that yeah he's sort of going in front of them like this and messing yeah. with ha, ha, them. Ha, ha. jumping yeah. in front of the truck and they're like get out of there get out of the way yeah, uh, yeah you know they're ready to kill him and stuff yeah and so it's kind of like you know like mess with nature you know mess with the forces of nature hmm. at your own peril sort of thing you know yeah. and you know the lessons you can learn from the indigenous people which is that indigenous people have like great myths and myths about nature about the mountain or about mm. you know the the animals in the in you know that the populate the the, the the countryside and they mm. shouldn't be messed with these are holy creatures and these are holy things that need to be sort of worshipped and respected and if you mess with them then that that way is 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 fraught with danger and catastrophe so maybe it's something about you know environmentalism mm. and you know you know the capitalist sort of uh desire for uh, riches and exploitation and how that ultimately um you know that that just leads to suffering catastrophe and mm. you know greed 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 it's bad isn't it mm. <laughs> yeah well one of the one of the things we did was last year wasn't it the corporation we we obviously t talked about that and i'd say nature and the corporations high end capitalism because i always differentiate between guy opening a shop that's still capitalism yeah. and high-end capitalism they both don't care you know they're both brutal and harsh and 
people glorify nature and obviously you know there's nothing better than lovely scenery and lovely landscape but it's also brutal you know yeah it will eat you yes yes <laughs> and also i think um I'm finding more and more, it's interesting during this discussion, we've talked about a lot of these 70s films and having just reviewed Deliverance, I, I'm, I'm thinking there's the, there's a the thing, the guys coming in from the city and the villagers that are dangerous to them because they don't understand them and the villagers don't really have anything to lose either. They haven't got anything. You mm. know? So the one advantage if you haven't got anything is you haven't got anything to lose. You know? These villagers who are of the country... And they the know it. They know the terrain. It's there. You're coming into their territory. Yeah. It's scary. You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They've been maybe sort of like touched by the wildness of, of nature and the, that lack of connection to the rest of civilization, and it's kind of turned them a bit dangerous. Yeah, and you're coming into their, on their turf, so to speak. Yeah. Right, right. Um, okay, if you've got any uh, closing remarks, please give them. But we're just going to recommend this. It's uh, Often you'll find films that are not appreciated at the time and grow over the years. That probably means that there's depth to them. And uh, there's such a lot of artistry to this film. I absolutely love it. So uh, obviously we're both recommending it. It is available. There is a print available on YouTube, as you said. Um, it's a bit of a sketchy yeah, one, though. Not the greatest one, yeah. So, yeah. so I don't know. I mean, like, you know, you could you could put two fingers up to the man and watch the, the YouTube version or whatever, mm. or you could, like, shell out and buy it through one of the major sort of uh, streaming don't, services. Don't mention their names, all right. Yeah. No, no, no names. Although yeah. I think maybe I did already, but, um, and uh, you can get the DVD, the Blu-ray. I think it's probably the best thing to do mm. uh, is to get the Blu-ray, watch it on a big screen, dim the lights, lower your expectations. Mm. Okay. Remember, this is a film that flopped massively at the box office. The initial mm. reviews were terrible. You've just maybe heard Anthony and me talking about it in glowing terms, but... Yeah. yeah, it's not it's not that good. You probably won't enjoy no, it, but no. watch it anyway. I'm only saying that in order to try and try and get rid of that, you know, the uh that building up the expectations thing. Um uh but yeah, just just enjoy the ride, yeah. Yeah, and what we could say is that there isn't an intricate plot that you're going to get lost in. So right from the beginning, yeah, the first few bits are mysterious. We don't know what's going on, but uh even the basic plot, you know, if you read the basic plot on uh, IMDb or whatever, that's more that's telling you as the basics and uh you can just enjoy the ride and enjoy the artistry and the amazing camera work and yeah, yeah just, thanks just, for getting me onto this film you and Scott. yeah 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 you're welcome thanks for letting mm. me come on and talk about uh, talk about it on your channel yeah fantastic all right and your podcast luke's english podcast as i said earlier it's not uh you know it's not populated by mass conjugation of verbs can i mention one one brilliant one because i know you're an alan partridge fan and obviously we're both hardcore you did a brilliant um what do you call it guided meditation and it was you <laughs> you reading what was the grammar point you were reading these unbelievably complicated i think it was reduced relative clauses and participle relative clauses that's it relative clauses yeah and you weren't doing a partridge voice but it was a it was a partridge level of far too much detail <laughs> and of course he did do a guided meditation didn't he once so you know, i thought that worked brilliantly yes. yeah that's luke's it's called luke's uh sleep meditation or yeah. something um and uh yeah so <laughs> i just brilliant. wanted to do a kind of guided sleep meditation mm. and it's like the, the the thing the thing is that i genuinely used every possible hypnotic method i could think of yeah. suggested you know i've read the the darren brown books and stuff yeah, yeah. so i genuinely tried to uh write a long script that would help people fall asleep and it's full of yeah. all of the different suggestive techniques and i i genuinely recommend that people don't listen to that when they're driving or something because it it will make you fall asleep mm. um if you lie down in bed and put that on then you'll be asleep by the end of it um, so I did that, but also I couldn't help adding comedy to it too. So, you know, oh, there's cool. lots of little jokes in it and stuff. To, well, well. I got confused. Did you do two? Cause you did one that was just relative clauses. You did another one where you, you did that thing that you hear of meditations where, um, make sure your toes are relaxed, make sure your feet. And then you said something like, make sure that thing at the back of your neck that no one knows the name of is relaxed. 
Was that a yeah, different yeah. one to the relative clauses? That's the same clauses? one, yeah. So the relative oh, the clauses one. comes yeah. a long time into the episode. So uh, there's, okay, it's about okay. 50 minutes long, and I think I start banging on about relative clauses after about 30 minutes of yeah. all of that hypnotic stuff of like, okay, relax your toes and your shins and your knees and that space behind your knees that no one knows the name of. Oh, relax that too. Relax yeah. your ankle. <laughs> Make sure your ankle is relaxed. Make sure your uncle is relaxed as well. You know, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I just couldn't genius. help. Keeping, putting in stupid jokes like that because so i thought right these people are going to listen to this they're going to be lying in bed and then 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 they're going to i'm going to make them laugh you know there's a bit where it's oh, like okay funny. take a deep breath uh like you imagine you're bob marley taking a big toke from a spliff <laughs> mm, rastafari you know <laughs> um oh, that's good. and i get messages from people saying oh you know what are you tr what are you doing to me I was trying to fall asleep and now I can't stop laughing. Yeah. So I was like, yes, mission accomplished. Put you to sleep with a chuckle, yeah. That yeah. uncle ankle thing, that was kind of for the English teachers, isn't it? Because obviously our students have a little trouble with that uncle yeah. ankle, yeah. Very good. <laughs> Make sure your uncle is relaxed. Give him a quick ring and just check. Yes. Yeah. It's like, and, yeah. you know, just make sure that the, uh, you know, close, make sure the curtains are properly closed. Um, right. And then I say, you know, I, 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 okay, I see you haven't. You haven't got up to close the curtains. That, that that's all right. But you know, if if you know if you, this isn't going to work unless you actually do the things I'm telling you to do. All right. So, but anyway, let's let's relax. Mm. Did you like, start getting? Yeah. Did you start getting irritated halfway through it? Because that that's very Python and Partridge. That's the idea, isn't it? <laughs> Sam will yeah, be relaxed. You know, <laughs> haven't you fucking got to sleep yet? Why are you still fucking listening to me? Yeah. There's a couple of passive aggressive moments. Yeah. yeah just yeah. just for just for the comedy. Yeah. Ah, oh, very good. Very good. And uh, as I said, right at the beginning, you were on the show, episode 15, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I might put some of our past collaborations in the show notes as well. So we did meditation. We did a lot of stuff on John Lennon, uh, corporation. And I, I think the life life only thing won't be out yet. But when it is out, I'll put it in the show notes anyway. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah. Thanks, um, Anthony. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's a weird chronology when you don't know when everything's coming out. So you're recording it and you're like, Shall I talk about that in the past? Oh, that thing that went out a couple of months ago. Yeah. We don't know when people are listening. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm massively stuck in a time loop. I, I'm in a massive time loop at the moment because, I mean, just for my podcast, um, my wife's pregnant at the moment. She's going to give birth in the summer. And so I'm producing as many episodes as I possibly can so that I've got them mm. all ready to be published. And I keep kind of doing the out i keep recording like interviews and then i do the outro mm. uh later on and i'm saying okay so and then i'm talking about how all right so as you're listening to this you will have heard all these other episodes i've done but i've oh, i have I've, I've recorded them but i haven't published them yet and as i'm speaking to you i've only just finished recording this one but yeah. you've heard this now so it's kind of like uh, you're both in the future and the past at the same time yeah. Yeah. so it's it's really confusing yeah so it's easy to get lost in a time loop yeah yeah i had that i was recording something on the end of february and it was going out in april and michael kane had his 90th birthday in march so i went a bit partridge and i said uh i hope michael's had a good birthday slash will have a good birthday <laughs> 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 you just can't help it no, partridge, partridge is can, can, just, they're just everywhere, aren't they? It's you know? totally infected me, and yeah. I can't. Yeah, it's you know, completely infected by partridge. As uh, when I'm teaching, sometimes I think, oh, you, God, yeah. I hope no one's listening to this. I mean, you know, I, I hope no, let's say, native English speakers who know partridge and and can pick up on those things. If they're listening to my lessons, they must think, Oh my God, yeah. is Alan Partridge teaching? Actually, I did have that once. I remember when I was teaching in Japan, one of my one of my colleagues said, I could hear your lesson there during my classes. I tell you what, you sound exactly like Alan Partridge. And I was like, uh, oh, God. Oh, yeah. God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, sometimes on a podcast where someone says something really insightful, I, I'm a bit tempted to say, God, that's good. <laughs> 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 I've got to try stand-up. I've got to try stand-up. Yeah. All right. <laughs> We'll leave that in the video. I'll probably cut that. You know, the, the serious audio film. Yeah. Film critics yeah. version. Very serious. Yes. yes. Here, we leave every, here we leave everything in. Mm -hmm. It's live. Well, it was is live now. Probably won't be live when you're actually watching it. It's not mm. think that too much. Let's hope we're all alive, um, <laughs> even now.
<laughs> yeah, so my nice. uncle's relaxed as well. Um, yeah, well, that's very important. Very important. <laughs> yeah, we have to do partridge at some point, but I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. I know should, you've done should... you've done episodes on it already, but. I've done six episodes on Partridge already oh, really? on my podcast. Yeah, wow. I've done quite heavy deep dives into it because you know I just mm. can't help it. But I, I did some episodes on Partridge. It was like uh, I went through uh, episode two from season one of I'm Alan Partridge. You know the one, the Valentine's Day one. Oh uh, yeah, oh, which might be my favourite yeah. one. Jill, do you like owls? Yeah, you know oh, they're all right because I know a cracking owl sanctuary. Yeah. Like you know, unless you can think of anything better, we could yeah. go shopping yeah. next shop. Owl, owl, owl yeah. sanctuary. Um, I did that, and it was like quite painstaking. And I got a few comments from people like, "Luke, what are you doing to us? What are you doing?" Because they just can't. Like Spanish people, for example, don't get that kind of cringe-related mm. humour, the awkwardness. I think, and they couldn't. Yeah. They're like, this, "This is too much. We can't handle it." Yeah. Um, but yeah, we should we should do some partridge again. But it's yeah, just very way. tricky. It's extremely tricky, and I have to. It has to be done under extremely controlled circumstances, um, mm. in order for it to land properly with my audience. Because if we just ramble about partridge and our love of partridge and how wonderful it is mm. it is, then we might alienate the audience, and they'll be like, "I am not understand." Yeah, I wonder if we could do a one-off, like more for ourselves than anyone else. We'll find a way. We'll, we'll find, find a way. way. Could put it on my YouTube channel something anyway we, we could we could talk about the you know the the alan partridge and the human condition there you go yeah yeah well we can make serious points about that couldn't we because it yeah. does it is about that that's yeah, why I mean, it's so good if it was just stupid it wouldn't be as funny but it's pro it is quite profound yeah he's a, he's a fascinating character mm. and i can't really explain it I, ca I can't really get to the bottom of what it is about partridge that is funny and that's what's great about it because if if comedy if you can explain comedy so easily Mm. then it's not that great but comedy which is unexplainable mm. that's good that's the good stuff yeah. yeah all right okay for the video audience i think the audio audience you wouldn't have got that last 10 minutes but i never know you never know who knows yes <laughs> <laughs> thanks everyone for watching and we're gonna sign off now all the best thank you goodbye cheers <laughs>